everybody good morning good morning true crime fans our second official dual stream live trial that we are covering folks chad daybell we appreciate you here particularly on this case we know there are a lot of other options so for you guys to spend your time with us we uh we really appreciate it we love you guys we love you guys and uh we hope that uh we make your journey through this what is sure to be an extremely bizarre case uh, much more enjoyable, and we hope to give you some knowledge that maybe you didn't have uh, about the law. Um, if we have questions, obviously, I'm sure that we will have nice little pop-ins from uh, my better half. Allie will, I'm sure, be popping in. She'll she'll get jealous that she's not on here because we covered <laughs> Lori Vallow. So um, I, I'm sure that we'll be seeing plenty of her. So uh, awesome. there's always that awesome. to look forward to as well. So uh, I'm excited about these openings, dude. You know, yeah. I, and I, I before I want to say to folks who are who are not familiar with this case, you know, Bob and I, and pretty much the channels in our group have the same philosophy, which is there are going to be some things in this openings and in this trial that are tough, folks. And we are strong advocates for you to take care of your mental health. Actually, I did it. I don't know if you saw it, Bob. I did a stream with Dr. Joni Johnston and Mac where we were prepping for this. And I'm going to put out the video maybe today or tomorrow. But she just said, I said, how do, how do you, when there's something like this, how do you like, what do you do? And she basically just said, know your own limits, know your own boundaries. If you have to step away, step away. If, if, if there's a day where you just can't watch it all, like we understand that folks, we'd rather you be okay, you know, and take care of yourself and take a break, go outside, watch something else. Cause there's some tough, right? But I mean, there's some tough big, stuff in this trial. Big time. I mean, when we get to the kids and what happened to them, um, it's going to be exceptionally difficult. Uh, I mean, there, there's going to be plenty of weirdness that I think that everybody will be able to handle when we're when we're diving into kind of the religious side of this case and just how bizarre Lori and Chad were. Um, I think everybody will be fine with that. But yeah, it, as we approach the areas where, you know, we're dealing with what uh, has befallen the children, you know, we'll, we'll we'll give you a heads up. We'll give you that uh, advance warning that, you know, this may be a day that you need to take care of your mental health. Absolutely. So guys, just, we, we will, and some people have given me shit and like, oh, this, you got to give a trigger warning during a murder trial. Yes. We're going to give trigger warnings because we care because some people don't know the details. And so, and, and I'm telling you right now, the openings are going to be a trigger warning because um, they're going to talk about like the details. So just a heads up right now, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to tell you there might be some tough stuff. And if you have, and as you know, I, before this actually, I guess the crumbly could be the first case I did with kids, but this is really the first I have avoided doing cases but you know we're going to do this case and i i understand why people this might be especially if you had i mean for everyone so just we're letting you know um 
And Bob, I have a special announcement. I, I, and I tweeted out this morning, folks, uh, Bob, when you were away, I did, um, I had never a truer word, which is an account. His name is Jack. Mm -hmm. and he, does, he does statement analysis he, where he looks at the words that people say. He has a great Twitter, folks. If you don't follow him, give him a sub. People who, so, and what, what I did was he, he researched Wendy Adelson's uh, police interview for like a week. And then mm -hmm. I had him come on. We watched it and he paused it and said, this is what she's doing here. This is what, like, he doesn't know for a fact what, he, he didn't know the case. So that was great. He was unbiased. He didn't know anything about the case. He's from England. Yeah. So anyway, so my announcement, folks, is if you are following that case, because I already set up a part two because people were so excited about it. And, the, you know, people who have seen that police interview thousands of times or hundreds of times, whatever, like I have, were like, wow, I never thought of this. Bob, uh, you know her and we love her. Julia Cowley is going to be coming for part two from the consult pod. She's the FBI profiler. She yeah. Has a she is, it was a profiler, took down, took down the, the Golden State Killer. So she's going to be joining Never a Truer Word with me. That's the 21st. So I, I, Get a little teaser because Bob, you tell me I never I don't do teasers right. So I did a little yeah. teaser on the Twitter. I just let I'm I'm too excited. I just let things go. So the 21st, uh, she's gonna be that sounds amazing. Me. That's a, may, maybe a truer word will convince me that they'll have enough for the last Wendy. Yeah, I mean, I'm so rooting I'm, for it. I'm rooting for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, he, he so he less the like he even says, like, I, I can't say for sure what this means. But in my analysis of, of uh, you know, covering this stuff, I could tell you that once, like one thing he, he noticed, he, he told us, which I never noticed before, you know, it's a five hour interview. And almost every time during that interview, before she like blurts out something weird, she says, oh, my God. And he's like, the, and we all started noticing, holy crap. Every time she goes, oh, my God. Tell and me. then he, yeah. So, so, and then he pointed out that there were, so there was three different people who were in the interview. There was the investigator, a victim's advocate. And a, and a friend that were in it, and like he's like she does three different roles for each of these people, and it was just, it was just fascinating to kind of break. Sounds it down amazing. With. Sounds amazing. So, so when is that going? Uh, April twenty first. So it's not this Sunday; it's next Sunday. Uh, right. And by the way, folks, don't um, worry. I am always, always, always keeping an eye on uh, the feed. I have it up right here, as you can see. Wait, why are me and Bob not on here? Uh, hold on. There we go. So I, I have it up. Um, so we were not missed it. They just have not gone live yet. So don't worry about that, folks. Let me put up the awesome banner then. So but I, we could, I'll go back to just us. I just want to want people to be like, if they're new to us, think we're just BSing and uh, and we're missing anything. So thanks for being here, guys. We love you guys. We love you guys. I'm uh, I'm of course late getting my tweet out about this. So I always do it right when we, well, because I like until I sign in, when we're doing duels, I don't have the link to my channel. You know what I mean? I think I'm, you could do it ahead of time. I think what happened last time, because I remember there was an issue last time, right? Where you like, I think what happens if you set it up ahead of time, you just have to make sure rather than going in, like, as if you're doing a new one, you go yeah. into that same link. So I think you can plan it ahead of time. I could. Oh, wrong. really? Oh, well, I that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That'd be so great. Just, All right. Let's see. By the way, it's supposed to start at ten thirty, but from when you know we cover jury selection, they're 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 late sometimes, folks. So as yeah. soon as as they go live, we will. Uh... Yeah, a, a typically, what's going on, you know, right before the beginning of a huge trial is a lot of housekeeping stuff. Um, it could be in chambers, you know, it could be in the, in the wall of the courtroom. Typically if it's in the wall of the courtroom, they'd probably be broadcasting at this point. But, um, you know, it, it's, everybody realizes when you're starting a trial, um, of this magnitude, kind of what's, what's at stake. So, um, you know, they, they try to clear things up and, you know, cause everyone wants the trial to run smoothly. So, and there's just a lot of little details that happen in trials that, um, you know, have to be addressed on the front end. I mean, I'd say typically we'd, we almost always had uh, like an in-chamber meeting with the judge, like on some of our bigger cases, you know, just like beforehand, just kind of like go through what's what, see what's getting covered today. Um, you know, just kind of letting the judge give, give the judge a heads up how many witnesses we have, things like that. So are you, when you're in that moment, are you just, you've been prepping for this for how long? Are you just chomping at the bit to get this thing stuck? Because you've had, all, you talk about it, you've already had those motions, that war beforehand, 
You've already had that, which to you, you know, you talk about all the time. That's what the most, but that's all done. Now it is go time. Are you just like yeah. chomping at the bit to go and get this thing started? Well, yeah, le leading into it, it's like um, abject terror. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like, you know, because your mind plays tricks on you. You know, you're like, oh, my God, am I prepared? Did I do enough? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so you're you're just torturing yourself going in. And then it's really a relief when it starts because all of that that pressure that you're building on yourself in terms of, you know, are you ready to go? just fades away you know because at that point you you literally slip into trial mode which is a very different thing that's where the rest of the world just kind of falls away and the only thing that that is in front of you is is the trial that's why like i'm always like i'm always get, making a comment when i see people in our chats who i love and i love all of them um, you know, talking about how lawyers are playing to the cameras, L lawyers in the middle of a case like this are completely unaware of the cameras in the moment, meaning that, of course, when they're getting dressed, when they're when they're, you know, getting their hair did, the butt of whipped, you know, they, they want to look good because they're aware that there are going to be cameras. But I'm talking about in the moment during the actual trial, you're not thinking about cameras. You know, you're not doing anything pandering to the cameras because you know why? Because we don't we don't mean shit. <laughs> the only the only 12 people that matter are the lawyers or the jurors. So that's it. That's all you're focused on. Like you're not worried wow. about what the world is going to say. Now, now we know Shannon, of course, went and got online <laughs> and was on socials. And you know, she knew she was getting hammered. That's a different thing. Again, I mean, obviously you're aware and in a high profile case, you know, if you're going to start reading your press clippings, which, you know, now are is social media, which used to be the newspaper, you know, I mean, you're bound to get your feelings hurt. You know, I mean, you have to have a very, very thick skin, really more than being a prosecutor, unless you're just brutal. Um being a defense attorney, you know, because people love to hate defense attorneys. Well, speaking of, have you uh, seen John Pryor at all, the defense attorney? Have you seen any of it? Have you seen him in action yet? Uh, well, I've seen him in his pretrial stuff. Yeah, I am not. <laughs> he's kind of a douche. I mean, I try not because I, of course, I love you, Bob. You're my brother from another mother. And I really since, you know, I try, I don't I for people who watch, I do not just randomly bash the defense attorneys like I didn't like Harpootly. I didn't like but like other ones, I will get like uh, Jenner, James Crumbly's attorney. I thought she did a great job. I'm not just going to arbitrarily, right. but this guy just uh, we'll see how it goes. This guy just just uh... yeah. I mean, there there's a lot of you know the the kind of the the art of practicing law. There, there's a lot to it, you know, in the psychology of the jury. There's a lot to it, you know, and there's you know, personalities in terms of how they come off when we're viewing them, like it's a TV show as opposed to a battle for somebody's life. Right. You know, you're just not thinking about that kind of shit. You know, it's like, it, it, had they televised the Garcia thing, people would have hated me, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I'm a very aggressive attorney and people have been like, why is this guy so fucking aggressive? You know, it's like, and, and you know, is a death penalty case. Like the only thing that I care about is that I'm making sure that the cops did their, their, their job. Right. And I'm making sure that, that witnesses aren't lying to the best of my ability. If I'm trying to call them out, like people would have like my cross examination of Celia Hoffman, who was the exotic dancer. Um, and who had claimed that, uh, our client had had confessed to her one night at the club that, that he had said to her that he had killed an old lady and a young boy and that and she became their star witness. And, you know, so there was many, many, many conversations with the team in terms of how do we handle her? Now, Allison had been bumped off the case because obviously I would have had Allison. I prefer to have a woman. Uh, cross-examining or directing a woman just because of optics, you know, like I never want to come off like I'm some like, like dickhead bully, you know what I mean? Like, you know, trying to put some, some woman down. Like, so I would always have Allison go in and be the bad guy, you know, cause then it's, it's woman to woman, um, you know, but that wasn't an option at that point. We had all men on the team. So, 
I was lead counsel. So I, I had to take it on and going into that, we're like, do I go at her hard? You know, is that the effective way? Is, is that the way do I try to, do I try to get her to crack, you know, and understanding the risk that if she holds up under intense cross-examination where I'm, I'm really coming at her, you know, does that lend to her credibility? You know, cause the things that we had, that we knew is that she, at the time she was addicted to drugs by her own admission, you know, and that she was a raging alcoholic at that point. She had said that she wouldn't trust anything that she said back at that time of her life. And that she, you know, she, you know, so it's like, I had these things that I could go with her with in terms of challenging her credibility and her memory, you know, but if she's able to withstand it, I, I also understood that it could backfire in a way that the jury finds her like, well, she's owning all this stuff. And I find the fact that she's owning it to make her credible, you know? So it's like, there's just a lot going on in terms of like, I, like no lawyers going willy nilly into a cross examination in terms of how they're going to handle it. Like, obviously if, if I feel the need to cross examine, um, you know, a, a victim's family member who may be testifying, I'm obviously going at that with kit gloves trying to be as sensitive as possible to them, you, you know, and, and really trying to minimize the questions as much as possible. So, I mean, you, you just, you think about all these things, you know, like, like people tend to forget when we're watching these things that it's not a TV show, it's not scripted. You know, these aren't professionally trained actors. These are human beings that have a job to do. And, you know, they, they go in there and they do the best that they can. And, you know, frankly, your, your personality is your personality. You know, there, there's certainly, an aspect to acting in, uh, you know, in, in any trial, you know, I mean, people are putting on uh, some sort of facade, whether it be the state, whether it be the, the defense, both, both sides are doing that to some extent, because you are trying to sell a case, you're trying to sell a theory, you know, you're, you're, that's, that's what your job is, you're trying to sell, because like I always say, no one was there, like no, the prosecutors, their defense attorneys weren't there, cops weren't there, you know, a majority of the time when this, when these crimes are committed. So every everyone involved from the defense and the, the state side are, are, have developed a theory based on the evidence. And their job is to sell the jury as to their theory is the correct one. You know, and, and I think you, I think you have to have some theater to you. We, we for, for us covering yeah. trials, we notice when there's someone who's just reading off like an opening or a closing, just reading off the paper and no emotion, you could tell. And the jury could if we could tell that. The jury could tell that. And like if you're if you don't believe in your case or yeah. at least if you can't fake that you believe in your case, it's going to be an issue. Yeah. And, and imagine how difficult that is from a defense attorney's perspective, you know, because we're privy to the evidence before it's admitted. We know what the 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 warts on the case are. We know what are going to be major issues for us going in. And that's what I'm saying. Like we do the best that we can to try to to mitigate damages you know, but like when you, cause it's just, it's easier to be the prosecutor because you're the one theoretically fighting for justice for the victims, you know? So they're viewed as, is the, the hero of the story, you know, typically, whereas the defense attorneys are the ones that are viewed as like, oh, they're representing the bad guy, you know? And that's just like moving forward into a trial. That's just kind of what everybody's perception is. I've been spending two and a half going on three years trying to explain to people it's not really what the role of a defense is like our role is not to trick you like we're not trying to get guilty people off if the evidence is there and the evidence is strong and the evidence allows the state to meet its burden beyond a reasonable doubt you know the role of the defense attorneys to make sure that the trial is fair make sure that they've done everything in their power to uh, make sure that their their client knows their rights under the law to make sure that the prosecutor is doing their job properly to make sure that the cops did their job properly. That's what our role becomes, you know, and if we do those things and a conviction happens, I can walk out of there with my head up knowing that I did my job properly. I, I gave the, the defendant the best defense possible. Uh, you know, I upheld the, the constitution and, you know, I can sleep at night. You know, if I go in there, you know, because like the worst, the worst thing that can ever happen as a defense attorney is you have an innocent, an innocent client, you know, and, and they go to prison or worse, um, you know, on your watch because you're the you're the mouthpiece, you're the one who does all the talking. It's all it's all based on your work. So 
you can imagine if you have a, a client that you firmly believe is innocent and who gets convicted, that haunts you forever, for eternity. You know, speaking and, about uh, or worse, if folks don't know, this is a death penalty trial, folks, if you were not aware <laughs> of that. So if he is found guilty, then the jury decides at that point if he gets the death penalty. And I'm sure we'll go over this later. But like there's certain like factors they have to consider. But this is it wasn't for Lori because I guess I think the state didn't get it in in time when, when it. But for 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 Chad, this is a death penalty case. Case, and in my opinion, if they come back guilty, as we talked about the details of this case, if they come back guilty, they're coming back with a death penalty. I don't know what you think, Bob. Hundred hundred <laughs> percent. They were chomping at the bit for Lori, and the only reason with Lori that they didn't get it was that, I mean, there were a couple of reasons, but the primary reason that the judge. Um, hung his hat on was the fact that uh, the prosecution had had really slow played getting discovery over to the defense so much so that they took that away from the state as being an option, which was a huge, huge impact on on that trial. You know, I mean, it's like I think people probably feel fortunate in, in terms of whatever they want Lori's fate to be. If, if they're hoping she's going to get the death penalty. I mean, it is available in Arizona where she's going to be tried next. So, um, you know, there, there's still a chance to get their just desserts or their eye for an eye with, with respect to Lori, but, um, yeah, no, here in, here in Idaho, um, yeah, they, they lost the ability to be able to elect for the death penalty in that case. And, and as you saw, Jake, because you covered, uh, you know, the jury selection, a, a large portion of that that preliminary inquiry into the juries was relating specifically to the death penalty. Those are the two. The two things were: did you have any basically? Well, actually, three things. Heart was it going to be a hardship? That was one thing they made a big. Did you have bias? Did you have any prior knowledge? And yeah, uh, death penalty. That was a bit. That was the third. Huge. Those, the three well, things that they really. They they have to know. They have to know going forward that if he's convicted that that people cannot have uh you know some kind of internal dilemma which will not allow them to give him the death penalty <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's yeah, like they booted someone who specifically said that there she's like i'm not gonna give the death penalty and the judge was like even if i tell you and and i think she was like well you know i'll think about essentially she was like she's not going to say that she won't she was like i i don't think i can do it and they're like boop see ya. we, we and that's a, not even that's not even a challenge that's a motion before where they're just like this cause person, both, it's both cause. people yeah cause yep. both people agree out we had a ton in in omaha in douglas county for garcia cuz that was a death penalty case we had a a lot and we in that case we had it took us a little longer than it took for Daybell's jury to get selected because we did everyone individually. Oh <laughs> Every, it Atlanta. was unbelievable. Wow. So it was in a conference room and it, we had a huge pool, a huge pool because we didn't win our motion for a change of venue, you know, and, and we had done something very similar to what they did in the Idaho four case. We had pulled the jury. Now we didn't put any facts of the case, like kind of what the controversy in that case is, is that the polling questions they felt gave too much information about the underlying facts of the case. Whereas with us, we had crafted five questions that were basically just trying to find out the, the level of uh, media coverage had that disseminated to a vast majority of the, the eligible jurors in that county. And if it had, if they were aware of the case, had they formed an opinion on it without getting into any of the underlying facts, you know what I'm saying? So, and, and we wanted to do that to show the judge to say, Hey, your honor, look, you know, this is what the percentages is, you know, based on, you know, X amount of people being surveyed. And, you know, we felt that it, it covered the, the appropriate kind of the, the metrics that we, we felt needed to be covered in terms of demos with age, you know, gender, things of that nature. And, you know, we thought it was compelling. We thought that we needed to do it in order to, to give the judge something tangible so that the judge knew exactly how many people had heard about the case, how many people had formed an opinion and what that opinion was, whether it be guilt or not guilt. Um, you know, so judge didn't find it compelling, you know, so we had to try the case there and, and they had tried our guy in the press for three years going into that case, you know, and, and it's like that as a defense attorney, that's tough. 
you know, because people come in with a predisposition and, you know, the way that, and I'm sure that you saw it quite a bit in the, the Daybell uh, Vordire where they're talking about, look, the judge considers it to be uh, that they have rehabilitated the juror. If they, they ask, okay, well, I understand that you formed an opinion as to innocence or guilt, but what I'm going to ask you right now is despite that, will you be able to put that aside? Will you be able to follow the law? and judge the facts and the evidence on it on its own merits during that and then come to an opinion and if they say yes the judge considers them to be rehabilitated which you know if you ask allison and i have always thought that that was total bullshit. i mean well like once we have formed an opinion in our minds it is nearly impossible to change it you know so it's like it, it creates a, a much much higher hill for for the defense to climb you know because Everybody talks about how the state has the burden and it's entirely their burden and Ooh. we don't need to put on defense. Are we rolling? I hear audio, but no video. Uh, so I'll go to it. It looks like we're, we're about to start. Uh, oh, there we go. By the way, folks, if you are new to this, um, uh, this is Zoom. This is his the judge's Zoom. So like, there's it's not like other trials where you have like great uh, uh, angles, folks. So just a, just a heads up. Um, All right, good morning, everyone. We're on up. the record now on Fremont County, JCR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Dado. Let me confirm with our uh, tech people in person. Hey, our banner is blocking the witness um, stand. I know, I was just going to say, Thank Mandy, you. are you here? Can you make the. Uh, the court uh, will note that as I we get started, start. there is a courtroom <laughs> conduct order in effect that you've all been advised. Please. Pay attention to just for now in terms of that order off. and getting uh, sure you don't have any devices Mandy can, that would go Mandy's off here. Of proceedings. No recording within this courtroom or photography of any type. The court is providing public access through the open proceedings as well as the live stream that's being conducted. With the court's live stream, we have, I think, the technology in place to accomplish that. Uh, if something comes up that interrupts the live broadcast of this trial, and this will be throughout the trial, uh, we'll give an opportunity to try to get that started again. However, if there's going to be any kind of significant delay in the live stream broadcast, the court will be continuing on with the proceedings. So there may be gaps in that, but uh, I think our technology is in place that hopefully that won't occur. But just so those listening in understand, if it does come up, we likely will not pause the trial longer than necessary to uh, make that accommodation. At this time, uh, I'll note also for the benefit of counsel, we do have all 18 jurors. Our 12 jurors with six alternates have arrived this morning, and everyone has submitted their juror affirmation sheet regarding following the court's admonishment while there's been gone no issues to bring up on the affirmations of the jurors so with that in mind then let me go to the state knowing the state is here present as the state ready to proceed this morning yes your honor thank you thank you is the defense ready to proceed yes your honor thank you okay thanks counsel All right, before we bring the jurors in, uh, which we'll do very shortly here, I also, as we are getting started and before the jurors are sworn and we take evidence, is there, I believe we've already had a motion to exclude witnesses. Let me just clarify on the record, is there going to be a motion to exclude witnesses through evidence portion of the trial made by the defense? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Uh, the court will reaffirm then there has been a motion to exclude witnesses. So as the state begins with its case in chief, keep that in mind that uh, they are not permitted to observe the trial proceedings, including the live stream. Uh, the only exception would be for a witness. If they statutorily qualify as a victim, then they are permitted to observe the proceedings. So each witness is going to be questioned whether or not they've observed any trial proceedings, and I would instruct uh, the state and then follow the defense if they have witnesses to make sure that the exclusionary rule is followed. 
Does the state have any questions on that matter? Your Honor, the state would just clarify and just make counsel and the court aware. It's the state's understanding that through the Constitution and statutorily, victims have a right to remain in the courtroom throughout the proceedings, regardless of whether or not they are victims. And we have discussed that uh, with defense counsel and made the court aware of who we think there may be a crossover with, um, meaning individuals that may be present and also witnesses. But statutorily, they would have the right to be here. So, including any of the defendant's children, as well as since they were Cammy's children, as well as um, siblings, sometimes grandparents. The court made a ruling last year in the Lori Vallow case. I think if we're following a similar guideline, those are the individuals that we would just note for the record may be present at times, but should have the right to be present throughout the proceedings. In addition, I would just note for the record that we do have our case agent who will be present for the duration duration of the proceedings and that's Chief Deputy Vince Kaikamani. Okay, and the state's permitted their case agent as it relates to victims, uh, the court agrees they are permitted to see the proceedings, including if they are a witness, uh, who would take up on a witness by witness basis, whether or not they fall within the statutory qualifications permitting that, and I know the state's aware of the issue uh, will make rulings contested as to whether or not they would qualify and later called to testify. Uh, Mr. Pryor, from the defense, any further comment or questions on the exclusionary ruling? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. All right, this time then we will have the jurors brought in. Yes, sir. By the way, folks, if you don't know, kind of cool thing about this is we are live All on, rise. Uh, on YouTube, Twitter, Kick. Check us out wherever you're at, folks. That's kind of a unique, I think, about me and Bob Stream. We're, we're, we're everywhere, folks. We're everywhere. And uh, we say this all the time, but if, if like you're on my channel and you're new and you're not familiar with Bob, make sure you subscribe to uh defense diaries folks i'm gonna put the link in now um, and likewise for our subs uh this is my brother jay i i, I would find that it hard to believe that you haven't met him yet Mr. but if you haven't the off chance make sure you're subbing to his he's got amazing content great human being dear dear friend all yeah, the good guys, things sorry guys i know that it sucks but it, this judge is like i'm just doing zoom and and this is the deal let's well, all right thank you ladies and gentlemen of the jury we're on the record on fremont county kcr 22 21 state of idaho versus chad guy abel we're ready to proceed with opening arguments and initial instructions this morning to you as jurors the court notes that the prosecution is present as well as the defendant and the defense attorney representing him as well. We have qualified this panel of 18 jurors consisting of our 12 jurors with six alternates, and they are now seated for trial. Let me start with the state and ask, will the state agree that the jury has now been properly seated and ready to be sworn? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Will the defense agree as well? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for returning this morning. You're now seated as jurors in the case before us. As previously been told, um, I'm Stephen W. Boyce, the district judge of Fremont County in charge of this courtroom trial. I'll briefly reintroduce you to some of our uh, court personnel assisting here today. Shannon Holstein, seated to my right, is the clerk who is keeping minutes of the trial proceedings, will be marking trial exhibits and administering oaths to you as jurors and to the witnesses. Uh, we do have our courtroom bailiffs as well to assist with keeping order in the courtroom and helping the jury move about where they're supposed to throughout the day and then enforcing any conduct orders we have in effect here for the trial. Our um, court reporter today in Bland is taking a stenographic record of everything said during the trial proceedings 
and my staff attorney Courtney Stallings proceeded to the far right who assist me with legal research and administrative matters that come on throughout each day of trial. Each one of you has been qualified, examined, and selected to serve as a juror of this court. The clerk will now have a roll call of our seated jurors. Please, Madam Clerk, if you would conduct the roll call. As to each juror, once your juror number is announced, please just uh, indicate present or here verbally so we acknowledge that on the record, Madam Clerk. Juror 27. Second. Juror 219. Here. Juror 505. Here. Juror 631. Here. Juror 653. Here. Juror 686. Present. Juror 752. Present. Juror 1680. Present. Does this make a big deal? Like, so there's this option. Does it even, like, what do you guys think? Which do you guys, this is a little bit bigger as far as the size, but you still can't really see great and, you know, Juror 761. Juror 997. And I gotta figure out how to make another Juror 1078. Uh, banner. Juror 1577. There are pictures are to Juror 1271. Juror 1382. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This case has been brought by the state of Idaho. I'll sometimes refer to the state as the prosecution. State is here represented in this trial by Lindsay Blake, Fremont County Prosecutor. Ms. Blake, you please stand briefly. Also, uh, Rob Wood is the Madison County Prosecutor. Ingrid Beatty is a Special Assistant Prosecutor. And Rocky Wixom is a Fremont County Deputy Prosecutor. The defendant in this case, Mr. Daybell, is represented by his attorney, John Fryer. Thank you, Counsel. In a few moments, the clerk will read you a redacted version of the amended indictment in this case. That document is not to be considered as evidence. It sets forth the charges against the defendant. You must not consider it as evidence of guilt and not be influenced by the fact that charges have been filed. Mr. Daybell has pled not guilty to the charges contained in the amended indictment. And please remember, again, it's a description of charges. It is not evidence. Under our law and system of justice, every defendant is presumed to be innocent. This means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Oh, Second, the state must prove What's the alleged up? crimes beyond a reasonable doubt. So a reasonable lady? doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from a lack of evidence. Mm -hmm. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. The duty of the jury is to determine the facts and then apply the law set forth in the instructions I will later give you to those facts. In this way, you will decide the case. In applying the court's instructions as to the controlling law, you must follow those instructions regardless of your opinion of what the law is or what the law should be or what any lawyer may state the law to be. During this course of the trial, including um, opening statements, you're instructed that you are not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else including using the internet or social media or any other form of communication, electronic or otherwise, do not conduct any personal investigation or look up any information from any source, including the internet, and do not form an opinion as to the merits of the case until after the case has been submitted to you for your determination. The court's given you that instruction now multiple times, and I will continue to give you that instruction uh, and again, that's not because I don't think you're not paying attention. Uh, it's just uh, important enough. We'll keep reiterating that. And I will note we received the juror affirmations today from each of the jurors indicating they have followed that instruction. So thank you for that. At this time, then, uh, the next matter we'll take up is to have this jury placed under oath for trial. At this time, then, Madam uh, Clerk, if you're ready to administer the oath, I'll have the jurors stand and will be placed on their oath. When you stand, then please raise your right hands. 
You solemnly swear or affirm that you will try the cause now on trial in a true verdict rendered here in according to the law and the evidence. So I'll do that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, the jurors have already been advised uh, of some of our trial procedures in this case, and I'll just give you some additional general information here. Our normal schedule is to run trial from 8.30 each day until 3.30. At times that will need to be modified for certain reasons. Sometimes we have matters to be argued outside of your presence. Sometimes uh, during the recesses, they may seem to go long because we're conducting other court business outside of your presence. But we will take recesses uh, through the morning and also in the afternoon. If anyone is uncomfortable, needs a break or recess for some specific reason, please notify the bailiff and we'll do our best to accommodate each of you and keep you comfortable while you're here. In addition, if anyone has any kind of accommodations they need, for example, assistance with a hearing device, uh, other matters, please notify the bailiff again, and we wanna make sure you are as comfortable as you can be and able to uh, be alert and attentive throughout the presentation of evidence in the case. These seats that you have been uh, assigned to at this time will be your specific seat throughout the trial. Please return to that same assigned seat each day or after each break so that we are able to determine who's here and if someone's not for some reason who's not here. Um, if there are interruptions at times during the trial, I know that can be frustrating, but we'll work our best to keep those to a minimum, move the trial as long as efficiently as possible, but at times it just uh, takes time to hear motions that are necessary outside of your presence. And then the uh, courtroom, and your location for deliberations as well as during the trial where you'll be held. We've provided, uh, of course, access to restrooms and other needs you may have. Uh, I'll address your compensation here. State law allows you for $10 a day for your jury service. However, after five days, that bumps up to $40 a day. So uh, this trial is expected to go some time you'll likely get into that increased range of compensation, and that's pursuant to item 2215. You're also entitled, I believe, to a mileage reimbursement for travel each day, and that can further... Look at that, Bob. Look at me. I created this on the fly. Now we got both our logos. It's not... I, I, this, I think we're good. Boom. What a guy. To you, you Just, I don't know. <laughs> when we have the third... Um, camera with the uh witness box i hope also uh, you may not have to work on another time, time or a lot of the time i mean as far as trial and you have case information here the availability to access the upper right hand corner bench and so Put, what the uh, logo you know, yeah well, models, i'm trying to block i'm trying to block the yellow uh, that's why i have uh, trial I issues I can put stuff on the top. Too. Yeah, I can, I can put stuff on the top. Can we just stream it directly from his Zoom? Well, the issue with that is you can't pause it and you can't rewind from his Zoom. Um, and I will. Guys, you know, confirm if that's that correct. I can't pause. Don't necessarily I'm memorize sure. everything I'm saying when the trial is concluded and you deliberate. You will have printed copies of these instructions to return to for reference. And if you'll give me. Just a moment here. I have a brief inquiry to make with my staff attorney. Correct. Thank you, Don. Can't pause there, Zoom. To try this case, I'll go over with you what will be happening. I will describe how the trial will be conducted and what what we will be doing. At the end of the trial, I'll give you more detailed guidance on how you are to reach your decision. Because the state has the burden of proof, it goes first. After the state's opening statement, the defense may make an opening statement or may wait until the state has presented its case. The state will offer evidence that it says will support the charges against the defendant. The defense may then present evidence that is not required to do so. If the defense does present evidence, the state may then present rebuttal evidence. 
This is evidence offered to answer the defense's evidence. After you have heard all of the evidence, I will give you additional instructions on the law. After you have heard the instructions, the state and the defense will each be given time for closing arguments. In their closing arguments, they will summarize the evidence to help you understand how it relates to the law. Just as the opening statements are not evidence, neither are the closing arguments. After the closing arguments, you will leave the courtroom together to make your decision. During your deliberations, you will have with you my instructions, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and any notes taken by you in court. The defendant is charged by the state of Idaho with a violation of law. The charges against the defendant are contained in the amended indictment. The amended indictment is simply a description of the charges. It is not evidence. Jury instruction number three. The defendant, Chad Idabel, has been charged in the amended indictment with certain counts of entering into a conspiracy with Lori Valadabel and or Alex Cox and or other co-conspirators. The crime of conspiracy involves an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. You must only consider the evidence against the defendant, Chad Idabel, in this case, and should not speculate as to any other case or legal proceedings involving any alleged co-conspirators. You must remember that the defendant, Chad Didevo has the presumption of innocence, and you must consider his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence provided in this case. Instruction number four, it is alleged that the crimes charged were committed on or about or on or between a certain date. If you find a crime was committed, the proof need not show that it was committed on that precise date. Instruction number five. Under our law and system of justice, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. Presumption of innocence means two things. First, the state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty. The state has that burden throughout the trial. The defendant is never required to prove his innocence, nor does the defendant ever have to produce any evidence at all. Second, the state must prove the alleged crime beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible or imaginary doubt. It is a doubt based on reason and common sense. It may arise from a careful and impartial consideration of all the evidence or from lack of evidence. If after considering all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt, you must find the defendant not guilty. Jury instruction number six. A defendant in a criminal trial has a constitutional right not to be compelled to testify. The decision whether to testify is left to the defendant acting with the advice and assistance of the defendant's lawyer. He must not draw any inference of guilt from the fact that the defendant may not testify, nor should this fact be discussed by you or enter into your deliberations in any way. During instruction number seven, if during the trial, I may say or do anything which suggests to you that I am inclined to favor the claims or positions of any party, you will not permit yourself to be influenced by any such suggestion. I will not express nor intend to express, nor will I intend to intimate any opinion as to which witnesses are or are not worthy of belief, what facts are or are not established, or what inferences should be drawn from the evidence. If any expression of mine seems to indicate an opinion relating to any of these matters, I will instruct you to disregard it. Jury instruction number eight. Your duties are to determine the facts, to apply the law, set forth in my instructions to those facts, and in this way to decide the case. In doing so, you must follow my instructions regardless of your own opinion of what the law is or should be, or what either side may state the law to be. You must consider them as a whole, not picking out one and disregarding others. The order in which the instructions are given has no significance as to their relative importance. The law requires that your decision be made solely upon the evidence before you. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence you in your deliberations. Faithful performance by you of these duties is vital to the administration of justice. 
In determining the facts, you may consider only the evidence admitted in this trial. This evidence consists of the testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits offered and received, and any stipulated or admitted facts. The production of evidence in court is governed by the rules of law. At times during the trial, an objection may be made to, question, to a question asked a witness or to a witness's answer or to an exhibit. This simply means I'm being asked to decide a particular rule of law. Arguments on the admissibility of evidence are designed to aid the court and are not to be considered by you nor affect your deliberations. If I sustain an objection to a question or to an exhibit, the witness may not answer the question or the exhibit may not be considered. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been or what the exhibit might have shown. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement or exhibit, you should put it out of your mind and not refer to it or rely on it in your later deliberations. During the trial, I may have to talk with the parties about the rules of law which should apply to this case. Sometimes that will occur over on the corner there. And we do have a device here that uh, whites out the noise so you can't hear us speaking there. At other times, I'll excuse you from the courtroom so that you can be comfortable while we work out any problems with evidence. You are not to speculate about any such discussions. They are necessary from time to time to help the trial run more smoothly. Some of you have probably heard the terms circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, and hearsay evidence. Do not be concerned with these terms. You are to consider all the evidence admitted in this trial. However, the law does not require you to believe all of the evidence. As the sole judges of the facts, you must determine what evidence you believe and what weight you attach to it. There is no magical formula by which one may evaluate testimony. You bring with you to this courtroom all the experience and background of your lives. In your everyday affairs, you determine for yourselves whom you believe, what you believe, and how much weight you attach to what you are told. The same considerations that you use in your everyday dealings and making these decisions are the considerations which you must apply in your deliberations. In deciding what you believe, do not make your decision simply because more witnesses may have testified one way than the other. Your role is to think about the testimony of each witness you heard and decide how much you believe of what the witness had to say. A witness who has special knowledge in a particular matter may give an opinion on that matter. In determining the weight to be given such an opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness and the reasons given for the opinion. You are not bound by such opinion. Give it the weight, if any, to which you deem it entitled. What is this thing? <laughs> what thing? What happened? During search and With what? What thing? At the conclusion was that you coughing? Or was that him? As to each I wasn't charge, me. Whether the state is <laughs> guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The subject of penalty or punishment is not to be discussed or considered by you in making these decisions. That is a matter which must not in any way affect your verdict. Jury instruction number 10. The state I'm, is seeking the death uh, penalty in this case. Breakfast. If the defendant is convicted of murder in the first Perfect degree, camera. there will then be a separate sentencing phase of the trial. At that sentencing phase, additional evidence may be presented and the jury will be given additional instructions. At the conclusion of that hearing, the jury will then decide if the defendant will be sentenced to death. If the jury decides that the defendant will not be sentenced to death, either the defendant will be sentenced to a term of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, or the judge will sentence the defendant to a term of life imprisonment during which the defendant could not be paroled for at least 10 years and possibly for life. Jury instruction number 11. If you wish, you may take notes to help you remember what witnesses said. If you do take notes, please keep them to yourself until after you and your fellow jurors go to the jury room to decide the case. You should not let note taking distract you so that you do not hear other answers by witnesses. When you leave at night, You'll leave your notes here with the bailiffs. If you do not take notes, 
You should rely on your own memory of what was said and not be overly influenced by the notes of other jurors. In addition, you cannot assign one person the duty of taking notes for all of you. Jury instruction number 12. It is important that as jurors and officers of this court, you obey the following instructions at any time you leave the jury box. Whether it be for recesses of the court during the day or when you leave the courtroom to go home at night. First, do not talk about the case among yourselves or with anyone else during the course of the trial. You should keep an open mind throughout the trial and not form or express an opinion about the case. You should only reach your decision after you have heard all the evidence, after you have heard my final instructions, and after the final arguments. You may discuss this case with the other members of the jury only after it is submitted to you for your decision. All such discussions should take place in the jury room. Second, do not let any person talk about the case in your presence. If anyone does talk about it to you, tell them you're a juror of the case. If they won't stop talking, then report that to the bailiff or the courtroom staff or as soon as you're able to do that. You should not tell your fellow jurors about what has happened. Third, during this trial, do not talk with any of the parties, their lawyers, or any witnesses. By this, I mean not only do not talk about the case, but do not talk at all, even to the past the time of day. In no other way can all parties be assured of the fairness they are entitled to expect from you as jurors. Fourth, during this trial, do not make any investigation of this case or inquiry outside of the courtroom on your own. Do not go to any place mentioned in the testimony without an order of the court to do so. You must not consult any books records, internet, or any other source of information unless I specifically authorize you to do so. Fifth, do not read about the case in the newspapers. Do not listen to radio or television broadcasts about the trial. You must base your verdict solely on what is presented in court and not upon any newspaper, radio, television, or other media account of what may have happened. Each day, you will be required, as I mentioned, to sign an affirmation that you will follow this admonition of the court. That concludes the court's first instructions then, and as I mentioned, you will be providing copies of those when we deliberate for further reference. Next at this time then, I am going to have the clerk read the amended and redacted indictment to you. Madam Clerk, if you're ready to read the amended indictment, please do that at this time. In the District Court of the 7th Judicial District of the State of Idaho, and in for the County of Fremont, State of Idaho Plaintiff versus Chad Bay Gay Bell Defendant, case number CR 22211623, amended indictment. Chad Guy Daybell is accused by the Grand Jury of Fremont County of this indictment as follows. Count one, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Daybell and or Lori Nori Ballo and or Alex Cox, deceased and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018 and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Fremont County, Idaho, and as part of the continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont Counties, Idaho, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Chiley Ryan and to commit grand theft by deception. Count two, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan for continuing criminal transactions in Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, or not being present, advised and encouraged its commission or by command compelled another to commit the crime and did so with malice of forethought and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being, to it, 
either kill Tylee Ryan and or assist in the killing of Tylee Ryan and or did encourage the killing of Tylee Ryan and or did command another to kill Tylee Ryan in violation of the Count three, conspiracy to commit first degree murder and grand theft by deception. The defendants, Chad Guy Daybell and or Lori Noreen Ballow and or Alex Cox deceased and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, in the County of Madison, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Fremont County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction and common scheme or plan in Madison and Fremont Counties, Idaho, that willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agree to commit murder in the first degree of Joshua Jackson Ballow, year and after J.J. Ballow, and to commit grand theft by deception. <clears throat> Count four, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Dado, on or between the 8th and 9th day of September 2018, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, and as part of a common scheme or plan for continuing criminal transactions between Madison and Fremont counties in Idaho, were concerned in the commission of a first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, were not being present, advised, and encouraged its commission, or by command compelled another to commit the crime, and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being. To it, did either kill J.J. Ballow and or assist in the killing of J.J. Ballow and or did encourage the killing of J.J. Ballow and or did command another to kill J.J. Ballow in violation of Idaho Code. Count five, conspiracy to commit first degree murder. The defendants, Chad Guy Baybell and or Lori Noreen Ballow and or Alex Cox deceased and or other co-conspirators, both known and unknown, on or between the dates of October 26, 2018, and continuing until January 15, 2020, in the County of Fremont, State of Idaho, and elsewhere, including Madison County, Idaho, and as part of a continuing criminal transaction in common scheme or plan in Fremont and Madison counties, Idaho, did willfully and knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, and agreed to commit murder in the first degree of Tamara Tammy Daybell, and did combine, excuse me, and did combine or conspire to commit murder, and one or more of such persons did an act to affect the object, combination, or conspiracy. Count six, first degree murder. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on October 18, to 19, 2019, in the county of Fremont, state of Idaho, was concerned in the commission of first degree murder and did aid and abet in its commission, or not being present, advised and encouraged its commission, or by command compelled another to commit the crime, and did so with malice of forethought, and did so willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation, which resulted in the death of a human being. To wit, did either kill Tamara Tammy Daybell and or assist in the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell and or did encourage the killing of Tamara Tammy Daybell and or did command another to kill Tamara Tammy Daybell in violation of Idaho Code. Count seven, insurance fraud. The defendant, Chad Guy Daybell, on or about October 19, 2019 through October 30, 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, did with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer for the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contained false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or thing material to such claim, to wit, did present and or cause to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to Life Map Assurance Company in violation of Idaho Code. Count nine, insurance fraud. That the defendant, Chad Magdabell, on or about October 19, 2019 through October 31, 2019, in the county of Madison, state of Idaho, 
intent with the intent to defraud or deceive an insurer for the purpose of obtaining any money or benefit, insurer or other person, a statement as part of or in support of a claim for payment or benefit, knowing that such statement contains false, incomplete, or misleading information concerning any fact or material thing to such claim. To it, it present and or cost to be presented an insurance beneficiary form to Primerica Life Insurance Company in violation of Idaho Code. Signed as a true bill on the 24th day of May, 2021, and signed by the deputy presiding grand juror, acting as presiding grand juror in Fremont County, state of Idaho. And to these charges, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. All right, thank you very much, Madam Clerk, for reading the redacted amended indictment. In this case, again, I will advise the jurors, remember the indictment is a description of charges. It is not evidence. That concludes the court's opening instructions and the reading of the indictment. The jury has been sworn as well. Uh, the next matter we would take up at our opening statements. Here we go. The fire of the state is the state of the procedure of openings. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, who will be giving the opening statement? I will remember very well. Mr. Williams, you may present your opening. Buckle up, Buttercups. And again, there's going to be some tough stuff in here, just a heads up. This is not going to be a quick opening. I'll tell you that right now. Your Honor, may I inquire? Is there a hand mic so that I may address the jury? I think we do have one. Like this moment, get it over to you. Hand, you have a PowerPoint attached. All right. Again, guys, the judge controls this Zoom. <laughs> not, unfortunately, not much we could do about the camera angles may i proceed your phone okay. yes it's from the hdmi may i proceed over yes sir. two dead children Buried in the defendant Chad Abel's backyard in September of 2019. The next month, his wife is found dead in their marital bed. 17 days after the death of his wife, Tammy Daybell, this defendant is photographed laughing and dancing on a beach in Hawaii at his wedding. It's Lori Vallow, a woman who is his mistress and the mother of the children buried in the graves on his property. Three dead bodies. This defendant believed he had a right beyond the ordinary. When he had a chance at what he considered his rightful destiny, he made sure that no person or no law would stand in his way. His desire for sex, money, and power led him to pursue those ambitions. And this pursuit led to the deaths of his wife and Lori's two innocent children. Chad Daybell is an author who wrote, tell, who wrote books about the apocalypse. During this trial, you will hear a story more troubling. And the story is real. Chapter 1. The defendant was a seemingly ordinary man. You'll see that he craved significance. He worked in journalism and he worked as a sexton in a graveyard. He married his wife Tammy in 1990 after meeting at Brigham Young University and they settled in Utah. As a full time homemaker and mother, Tammy's love for her family was balanced. Look, you guys, it's not me type. Together, Tammy and the defendant started a small publishing <laughs> company. Somebody's got a real heavy ski stroke. They had five children together. <laughs> they moved to Idaho, where Tammy became a beloved school librarian. She was devoted to service, her community, and her faith. But for this defendant, 
That ordinary existence was not enough. Chapter 2. Lori Vallow was a homemaker for Arizona. Your Honor, this mic just... Sorry, Mr. Lee. Let's see if we get a replacement mic. I think it's... I got it working now. Okay. I noticed that the PowerPoint is not up. Yeah, I think your mic's off again. Okay, I didn't turn it off this time, so I didn't mm -hmm. like that one. That one to read. Bob, we got over uh, 1K viewers on our multiple platforms. Thank you all Ooh. so much for being here. 1,000 viewers. Look at us, Jay. Just Look at us, kids. Go. <laughs> you are to from Started from nothing. Well. Your Honor, it's up on the screen, and I can explode the HDMI. I'm not sure why it's not transferred. I can't change the view of the cameras, guys. That's the judge's deal. I, I, I wish they could. Well, first down, that. Let's see if we can get some help to maybe see if we can get the signal to work on that. Yeah, no close-ups. No close-ups during this trial there, Jay. Luckily, none of, of Chudley. This is, uh, this is what life looks like to me in general. Pretty blurry. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have contacts? I mean, my, my, uh, what's it called? My LASIK changed. Chapter 2. Lori Vallow was a homemaker from Arizona. She was married to her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, and she was the mother to Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Tylee was a normal, vibrant teenage girl. She loved her friends. You'll hear that she loved her Jeep. She loved Chipotle. She loved her little brother, J.J. J.J. was a seven-year-old boy on the autism spectrum. He required extensive special care needs. He loved his sister. You'll hear about a pivotal date that set in motion the deaths of Tammy, Tylee, and JJ. October 26, 2018. That was the day when Chad Amo and Lori Vallow met at a religious conference in St. George, Utah, where they were introduced by a mutual acquaintance. At this time, both still married to other spouses. That introduction set in motion the reality you're going to hear about. We know what happened next to the defendant's own words. You'll hear. Though both married, Chad and Lori began to have an affair. You will hear excerpts from the defendant's extended text messages to Lori that reveal his mindset and his motivations. In his thirst for sex, power, and money, Chad created an alternate reality where they called themselves James and Elena, names that Chad claimed were from past lives they had put together. The defendant's text messages reveal their story of lust and their plan for a future together. Chad Dayville wrote that upon meeting Lori Vallow, he experienced a happiness unmatched by anything else in his 50 years. He was captivated by her appearance, so much so he said she was out of his feet. You will hear evidence in his own words, how he was taken by her beauty and spoke about their sexual encounters on many occasions. More than anything else, Chad's obsession with Lori was rooted in her adoration for him. She was the mirror reflecting the grandeur he saw in himself. He called her an exalted goddess. He told her in writing that she had returned to Earth to perform a special mission. Part of that mission included being with him. They soon came together and turned their dreams into a plan for the future. One three from what they called obstacles, and those obstacles were Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. Chapter 3. You'll hear that in the world that Chad and Lori planned for themselves, they identified those who stood in their, the way of their dream as dark. Their spouses, Lori's own children, and any who oppose them were labeled sometimes as dark spirits or even zombies. 
This was more than an alleged belief of frightening labor. The evidence will show that it was a convenient narrative that dehumanized people who stood in their way and who were labeled as obstacles. This narrative gave them the pretext to remove people from this world for their own good. Chad and Lori preached that only through spiritual intervention, what they sometimes call casting, sometimes through burning, or even through death, that these dark spirits be cleansed. Enter Alex Cox, oh, Lori's devoted brother. Chad and Lori manipulated Alex with promises of spiritual rewards. They wielded their influence over Alex, drawing him into their plotting and planning of their own future. After the deaths of Tyler, JJ, and Tammy, Chad Dingo gave Alex a blessing. It was This blessing was reported by Lori, who was present. And in that blessing, he said to Alex, you have earned the privilege to be a member of their exclusive religious group. And he also said to him, you have already assisted us in ways that can never be repaid. But you will also see other text messages. Chad and Lori discussed more earthly concerns that Alex could be the one to implicate them. Alex knew this as well. Shortly before he died, on December 12, 2019, he told his wife, Zuana Pastenis, who you will hear from, he was afraid he was going to be Chad and Lori's fault guy. Chapter 4. Once their calculated plan was devised, it only took months to execute and remove perceived obstacles in Chad Daybell's path to a new life. Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, who was labeled as dark by the defendant, was shot and killed by Alex Cox in Arizona. Lori stood to gain $1 million, money that could fund Chad and Lori's future. Yet following Charles' death, Lori Vallow awaited a $1 million life insurance payout that never came only to learn that the beneficiary was no longer her. Upon learning she would not receive that insurance money, Lori would text Chad, I'll still get the $4,000 a month from SS, meaning Social Security. Chad replied to her in a text that read, it will be interesting to see oh if it got changed after he had two bullets in his chest. Oh my God, guys, sorry, hold on. Tylee yeah. Ryan, <laughs> also branded dark. Right, big face Chad. <laughs> September 8, 2019. That's what I get for trying while we're live. Subsequent investigations revealed the horrifying truth. Her remains, charred and dismembered, were found in a grave on Chad Abel's property. Without Charles's $1 million in insurance money to support them, Lori Vallow continued to illegally receive Tylee's Social Security benefits provided after the death of Tylee's biological father, who had been Lori's third husband. According to this defendant, J.J. Vallow, Lori's son, was also possessed. After he was labeled as a dark entity, his fate was no less tragic than his sister's. His young life was also blamed. Later, his bound body was discovered buried in Chad's backyard his death by suffocation. Yet while JJ was missing, Lori continued to illegally receive JJ's social security benefit, money provided by Charles Fallow's dad. Tammy Daybell, a vivacious, healthy mother, was another individual labeled as a dark spirit to be removed. On October 9th of 2019, she reported being shot at at night near her home by a man covered in black. She thought it was a paintball gun. On October 19th, 10 days later, she died in her own home with her husband present. This was soon after an increase in the value of her life insurance to more than $400,000. This defendant rapidly cashed in that life insurance and began looking for condos in Hawaii with Lori. You'll see the rental application he submitted for a couple with no kids. Medical, examiner, medical examiners would later determine that the only reasonable explanation for Tammy's death was not of natural causes, 
but rather a homicide. In fact, you will hear from multiple witnesses that Chad predicted multiple times that Tammy would die and her would die. Chapter 5. 17 days after his wife's death, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow got married and celebrated on the beach in Hawaii, Hawaii, symbolizing what he called their eternal union. Chad and Lori were preparing their wedding well before Tammy's death. Lori was shopping for wedding rings while Tammy was still alive. Now, without the earthly obstacles of spouses and young children, and with Tammy's insurance policy and the children's social security funds, they could live the life that Chad and Lori wanted. Matthew was going to stand in their way. Chapter 6. Unfortunately for this defendant, reality soon shattered their bliss. Two things led law enforcement to his and Lori's door. On October 2nd, 2019, Lori Vallow's nephew-in-law, a man named Brandon Boudreau, was shot at in Arizona by someone from what he believed was Tyler's Jeep. Law enforcement in Arizona investigating Brandon's shooting contacted law enforcement in Fremont County, Idaho to look for Alex Cox and for Tyler's Jeep. And you'll hear that that Jeep was later found in Rexford, Idaho, in Madison County. Meanwhile, J.J. Bell's grandmother, concerned that she hadn't seen or heard from him in months, asked police for help. They, the police followed up and located Lori in Rexburg, Idaho, where the police did a welfare check at Lori's apartment. Law enforcement arrived at Lori's door on November 26, 2019. When asked about Lori, Chad first told law enforcement he didn't know her very well, despite the fact that they were married and had been in a relationship for over a year. Lies by Lori to police about JJ and Tiny's whereabouts, and then a move to Hawaii, and Lori's unwillingness to present her children to law enforcement to prove their well-being led to her arrest and extradition. As Lori refused to produce her children, Law enforcement continued their search for Tyrone and JJ. During that search, they located a unique text message that this defendant, Chad Daybell, had sent to his wife, Tammy, on September 9, 2019, which was one the day after Tyler Bryant's last known appearance. You'll hear from the FBI agent who found that message, but this message seemed longer than his usual text to Tammy and it had a more conversational tone. In that text, <coughs> Chad claimed he'd had an interesting morning, that he'd shot a raccoon, that he'd buried it in what they called the pet cemetery, and that he'd had a fire on the property where he burned some wind debris. When law enforcement finally went to the defendant's property the following June, they didn't find a raccoon. They found Tylee's burnt remains that were buried. Except. And they found JJ nearby, buried under a tree near a pond. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been told this would be a lengthy trial. You will hear from many witnesses. You will hear a lot of evidence. You're going to hear a lot of dates. The following is just a timeline of major events to help understand when these things took place. October 26, 2018, Chad and Lori meet in St. George, Utah. July 11, 2019, Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, is shot and killed by Alex Cox. Between August 31st and September 1st, Lori, Alex Cox, and Tyler and JJ moved to Rexburg, Idaho just a few miles south of the defendant's home. Tylee's last known sighting was September 8, 2019. The text I just spoke of about the raccoon was sent by the defendant to his wife September 9, 2019. JJ's last known sighting, you'll hear about, September 22nd. 
The attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux in Arizona was October 2nd. The shooting I mentioned of Tammy, the shooting, shooting at her, the unsuccessful shooting, October 9th, 2019. Tammy's death, October 19th, 2019. 17 days later, Chad and Lori marry in Hawaii. Law enforcement did a welfare check looking for JJ, November 26, 2019, in Rexburg, Idaho. November 26th and 27th, Chad and Lori leave town. June 9th, 2020, Tylee and JJ's remains are found on Chad's property. As I said, you're going to hear a lot of evidence from a lot of witnesses. And there's going to be kind of different groups of evidence you're going to hear from. You'll hear from law enforcement, who will, some of whom will give you a broad overview of the investigation and what they did, how the search from Tylee and JJ turned them to a case of murder. You'll hear how it began by people who knew Lori and Chad. The James and Elena, you'll hear about the James and Elena story and about their relationship with each other and how they pursued their dream, their plan for a life together. You'll hear in the defendant's own words, people referred to as obstacles, how they need to be gotten rid of. You're going to hear financial evidence. You'll hear from an FBI forensic accountant and a detective, a social security uh, administrator, investigator, who will talk about the finances involved in this case. You'll hear more from law enforcement, from multiple law enforcement agencies, the Rexburg Police, the Fremont County Sheriff's Department, the FBI, Social Security Administration, about the investigation into these crimes. You will see forensic evidence. There, you'll see DNA testing to identify the body of Tylee. You'll see DNA testing that showed DNA from Tylee was found on at least two tools in the defendant's shed. You'll hear digital evidence dealing with geolocation data tied to certain phones that we used in this case. You'll hear from Hawaii law enforcement about searches they performed in Hawaii on the defendant and his wife. And finally, you will hear many of this defendant's own words. You will hear voice recordings of this defendant. You'll hear, you'll hear excuse me, recorded phone calls between him and his wife, Lori Abel. You'll read multiple texts that he and Lori sent back one another. Another text he sent. <laughs> Chapter 9, What's Unwritten. The defendant stands before you today charged with multiple crimes. First degree murder for the death of Tammy Daybell. First degree murder for the death of Tylee Ryan. First degree murder for the death of J.J. Ballow. Conspiracy to commit murder of Tammy Daybell. Conspiracy to commit murder and grant that by deception. The death of Tylee Ryan. Conspiracy to commit murder and grand theft by deception for the death of J.J. Ballard and insurance fraud. Two dead children buried in this defendant's backyard. The next month, his wife dead in their bed. 17 days later, this defendant marries Lori Ballow. Members of the jury, days or probably weeks from now, when the evidence in this trial is fully unfolded, we will have the opportunity to speak with you again. And at that time, we will ask you to end this horrible narrative. Your verdict will be the link that writes the final chapter of this tragic saga, a chapter that delivers justice for Tammy, justice for JJ, and justice for Tyler. Thank you. Very efficient. Very efficient. Now I'm I'm really excited to hear 
priors. Like we don't we don't know, folks. Like Bob was talking about, we don't know the defense really until this moment. What's the theory going to be? Mr. Pryor, a couple of questions first. Alex Cox is going to give an opening statement now or defer until later. And second, if you are going to give an opening statement, we would take a mid morning recess or go forward. Judge, could we take a short recess? And I have a Okay, I think this is a good time then for our mid morning break. We'll go ahead and take said, that now. And then that's, that's concluded. He said, the we're going to take a break, but he had to go forward. Judge, could we take a short recess? And I have a Okay, I think this eh. is a good time then for our mid morning break. We'll go ahead and take that now. Judge, can we take and a short break? I have a. Yeah. 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 Oh. Sure. All right. Sure. I'm not sure what you said, sir, but um, all right, well, so that, that was a fact, see, man. Let me just see. I just want to see if they say when exactly they're coming back here before we. Uh... Nope. Why? I hate when they don't tell us. All right. So go ahead, Bob. You, you thought it's that a was mystery. Good? It's a mystery. Yeah. So, I mean, like opening statements are really the, the entire point of them is to give the jury a roadmap of what they can expect during the trial. Um, you know, you're always supposed to use, uh, certain kind of like key phrases, um, which, which they did. And, you know, it, it's essentially saying, look, you, you will see testimony of this and this and that because they, they have to tell the story, right? I mean, it, it's like, what trial was that? Traconis where you and I were like, oh my God, they didn't do opening statements. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was. <laughs> How the hell does the jury know, you know, what, what's going on here? It's like, they have to put the pieces together. And, um, and I guess that is the, I guess that's par for the course up there. Um, like it, it was very unusual to me. I had never seen a case where they didn't kind of give the jury the, the background of what the case is, um, you know, but here, he did a nice job. You know, he kind of laid it out, you know, uh, kind of went through all the charges and, um, you know, and he was quick. Like he easily could have taken hours <laughs> to do that because the trial is going to take forever. Um, you know, and, and there's, if you guys did not follow Lori Vallow, um, be prepared. There is going to be just fascinating testimony and I, i'm super excited to see what approach the the state's going to take here you know the way it went with lori vallow is i'd say the first week maybe longer was, was all related to the religious side of the tale wherein they were putting on kind of like the cult members if you want to call them you know the converts um which were fascinating man it's like because you're, you're hearing from these folks that were like uncomfortably having to get onto the stand and admit that they were that they had been indoctrinated by these two you know that they were cult members you know it's like you and i were talking about like when you were doing all your twin flame shit you know and it's like most people are like i would never like they never suck me into a cult they could never like oh, i'm smart like you know but it happens it happens to bright people and uh you know i i think there's probably other things going on in people's lives where they're they're searching for something searching we for had answers. yeah bob when we had uh dr john by the way folks we did a when bob was on his vacay with me and Sean did a couple streams. We did one with Lori Hellis and we did one with Dr. Johnson and uh, Dr. Joni Johnson, who's amazing, and, and Cheryl Mack McCollum. So if you want to take a look at that, because Sean asked her that exact question, similar yeah. to what you're talking about, Bob. People, you know, a lot of people will say, like I, like you said, never would never be, would be me. But like, first of all, there's some people that are just born into it. If you're born yep. into it, why would you question it? Why would you question right. anything? How and could second, you if you right, don't know how, anything else, right? Right. Particularly when, when their whole thing is not only their whole thing is you don't, they don't want you talking and they don't want you thinking. The whole idea is like, you're not allowed to watch the outside media or you're right. Like, that's the devil. Right. So like, yeah. you're not, why would you? And like you said, if you're an adult and maybe have like 
something traumatic happened to you or, or what, for whatever reason, but it, it, you right. know, it could, you could have to vote. for something you're searching, right. whether it be love, whether it be, you know, healing from trauma, whatever the case may be. It's like you're, you're searching for something and you haven't found the answers in the, in the outside world. And, you know, they, they say something that resonates with you. You know, they say something that, that, you know, just strikes at the heart of what you're, you're, you're searching for. And, and at that point, you know, and they always think that these people are legitimate on the front end. You know what I mean? It's it's usually not until, you know, shit so, you know, like starts going sideways that, you know, you figure out like, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, but it, it's very tough to extract yourself from it. You know, it, it's not just a matter of, oh, well, I, I've come to the conclusion finally that these people are completely full of shit. And, you know, now I've got to get myself out of it. It, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. I mean, you, you see those, you see those stories where families are going in, trying to extract their loved ones because, right. you know, the, the, the loved ones are incapable of <clears throat> doing it themselves for various reasons. So we're, we're going to see a lot of that, man. We're, yeah, it's a total psychology. We're, we're going to no, see. No, no, no. I said that. Uh, no. Look at Scientology, like how people, like if oh. you watch any of those docs, people, sure. they, once you're out, like your family is told you don't talk to them anymore. If people, yeah. like you lose, literally you lose, like you can lose your mom or dad. Like, you know how hard that must be for these folks that have to, like they, they figure it out. Like, oh my God, I'm going to go. They leave. But then like a lot of these, they're like, these people are gone. You can't talk to them anymore. That's not like, like the, the, the trauma right. that that causes. I mean, well, that, that's like part of like initially when you're going to start a cult, like rule one a is that you have to like you have to get the the cultists to agree that you know they're no longer going to have contact with their loved ones their friends their family that this just it doesn't work you know because they know you know if you've got if you've got that 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 person in your ear being like dude what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like the, uh, these people are insane. Like, like, listen to me. Look at me. Look at me. Grab their face. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Step out of it. What's wrong with you? You know, it's like you can't, you can't have that going if you're on the cult side of it. Um, you know, really just kind of like trashing everything that you're doing and and trying to get them in. So, yeah, we're gonna see a lot of that. Like, you know, if they if they're gonna put Melanie on and uh, Zaluma. <laughs> These witnesses are going to blow your mind, dude. Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. It really is. So like it, the state did a great job kind of laying out the case and it, and it was different in Lori's case because it was really centered around the conspiracy charges and they had to be able to show um, that she was complicit you know, and that she knew and that she was involved with the conspiracy, that she was an active participant. Um, and, it, and it was really, they had to do it circumstantially. You know, they didn't really have like smoking gun evidence, but they had a ton of stuff that circumstantially would indicate that certainly she knew. And I kept saying it throughout the, you know, throughout our coverage of that. I'm like, I, I don't care if, if they're going to be able to show it fully, the, the fact of the matter is, is that this woman's children died on her watch and she didn't give a shit. Her response was to move to Hawaii. You know, it's like she was going down and I didn't really care what the state showed. <laughs> you know, like you just knew that there, there was no one was giving her a pass out there. Um, you know, and, and with this case, it's different because they're, it's not just the conspiracies, but they're charging them with the actual the murders themselves, um, which they didn't do with, with, uh, Lori, you know, because I mean, she, she was alibied, you know, for, for a lot of these things, um, you know, and, and the, the Charles Vallow stuff was, was really, really interesting. And, you know, it, it was, it was surprising that that was allowed in, but it was, you know, it was prior bad act type stuff, you know, that, you know, that 404B stuff that we love so much from the Murdoch trial, you know, where you're, you're getting in these other acts, uh, cause that thing took place in Arizona, you know, that wasn't something that had taken place in Idaho. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see the way that the state's going to put the case together. 
Um, you know, one of the advantages, this is almost like having a retrial. It's like a rehearsal. They have, they already had a rehearsal. They've already right. done this one before. There are a much, isn't it like an advantage as opposed to, to prior? A, a, in addition to what you talk about all the time, where the state has a whole team, where prior is just pretty much it. You know what I mean? It's like a whole, and yeah. this is their second time. They've done this before. And, and you know, for prior, it's not as nearly as big of his, as an advantage because I'm sure he sat in on Lori's trial, but it, there's different there's different things that have to be proved up against Daybell than, than had to be proved up against Lori, you know, and in terms of, you know, kind of the financial crime side of this where, you know, Lori and, and Chad were continuing to take the, the disability, the S social security disability checks after the kids were already gone. Like that, that factual scenario is the exact same, but in terms of, you know, what Chad's hand in this was, you know what what he was really responsible for is very different than than Lori so it's it's going to be different in a lot of different ways it's certainly not a, a like a rerun um you know and and it's i talked about it with with Shannon Smith um in the Crumbly case man you, you know like one single attorney going through this trial alone without any kind of help in terms of digging through you know the evidence and the files and they, like all of your you know all of your prepared stuff to get to get prepared to to move with each witness and, and you know follow what the witness is saying and make the proper objections and you know crafting your your cross-examination because yeah i mean you can anticipate a vast majority of what you're going to cross witnesses on but there there's always going to be things that are said that that you weren't anticipating you know and that goes to what i'm always talking about like in illinois we don't have the opportunity typically to speak to state witnesses you know because we can't depose witnesses ahead of time um in trials like and that varies from state to state i love states that allow for defense attorneys to uh be able to uh depose witnesses for the state because typically the response is look uh hold on one second when your pi knocks at their door they go and they call law enforcement or the prosecutor's attorney or the prosecutors often say hey man the defense or his guy is here which i do and they they can't tell them not to speak to us but they can tell them you don't have to speak to them you know and, and when you're coming into a trial you know the number one rule of cross-examination is never to ask a question that you don't know the answer to you know i've said this a bunch of times on the stream but you know for those of you who, who've never hung with us you know and that's that's hard you know because there's questions you want to ask but you're terrified to know the answer because it may not be the answer that you want and it could be an answer that absolutely blows your case apart you know so when you don't have the advantage of being able to speak with witnesses prior to and that goes both ways you know the state obviously has the opportunity to send investigators out to talk to our witnesses because we have to provide witnesses both sides provide witnesses uh, witness lists and so you know but it's just it just so happens it's very difficult for us to be able to get um you know a sit down with state witnesses just because you know of the view of the defense and the view of the defendants you know it's like that even though there is a presumption of innocence the reality is everybody typically in this country presumes somebody if they've been arrested has done something wrong like that's that's what the mindset is that's the reality it's just being a human being well they were arrested for something <laughs> you know what i mean so it's like it, it's it's a very challenging thing to kind of overcome in order to be able to prepare yourself for trial so yeah I, like prior's gonna have a huge job in front of them i anticipate there's going to be a lot of, uh, oh, hold on, Your Honor. Uh, oh, wait a second. Uh, him fumbling through papers and because he doesn't have that support staff or even another attorney to help him do that. So I'm sure he'll be, you know, bugging the shit out of people, you know, during so this. Let me ask you this. Trial. Speaking of that, how important, you know, you talk about investigators a lot. How important is that to you as a defense attorney? You're an investigator. Like, how important is that person as you're preparing that case for them to, like, get evidence, talk to witnesses. Some of them may not talk to them, but some of them may like you, but you must have to like, when you're, you know, creating your firm or hiring people, that must be someone you really have to Huge. trust and, and, and like have good experience because they, they have such an important job, right? 
huge man it's like it took us forever to find our our pi um oddly enough our last episode of defense diaries the the podcast uh were we had sent our guy who was a former law enforcement he was a former like uh, sheriff the sheriff uh before he retired and then he went to a uh, private detective and we you know we sent him out to talk to cecilia hoffman sent him out to Terre Haute, indiana to interview her and which he did and uh yeah i mean it, it's difficult to find because you want somebody who's trained law enforcement you know you want somebody who knows how to ask questions and to try to get answers and you know because you can't assume when law enforcement's conducting their investigation and they kind of land on somebody and that tunnel vision forms you, you know they're not asking anything beyond that you know that person you know they're, they're not asking things that you know like that, that may involve other people because they're now focused on one individual so when i get a police report it's all going to be relative to the person that is my client because that's who they develop tunnel vision on whereas if we think there's alternate suspects or you know we we have to do our own investigation it's it's our duty we have to investigate we have an absolute duty to investigate um on behalf of our client and yeah I, and it would be great to have a police force wouldn't it you know it's <laughs> it's like when i talk about the power and the resources of the state that's what i'm talking about i mean law enforcement is their arm and i'm talking about the prosecutors it's their arm of of investigators that, that they have at their disposal at any time the prosecutor calls up their cops and said hey man this is what we need you know is his trial is proceeding you know and, and the cops are going to do everything they can to try to get what the prosecutor is saying hey we think we're we're we think we're light here you know we're going to need more on this particular issue so start digging you know what i mean so and for us you know we don't have those resources we don't have the resources we don't have the manpower so we're always we're always up against it it's just it's a it's a tough gig man i, I tell everybody it's i don't know of a tougher job than defense attorney you know in a lot of different ways not just the mechanics of it but you know dealing with like all the other shit that you have to deal with as a defense attorney it's like i take all kinds of heat on my delphi coverage you know it's like i take because i'm adamant that that I, I have no idea whether that you know richard allen killed the girls or didn't kill the girls but what i do know is that his rights are being trampled upon and that matters to all of us as, as citizens of this country and you know people misconstrue that you know people misconstrue oh oh they think they think rick allen's innocent i'm like i have no idea there hasn't been a trial yet which is my point no one should be forming final opinions on innocence or guilt until this is happening after this is done then you can form your final opinion everything that precedes this it, it like we don't know you know i mean are there obviously cases where huge amounts of evidence are released to where like like i i feel very confident that they got rex the right guy on, on uh on rexy you know, boy yeah rex man like I, I feel like they got the right dude you know is that still subject to trial of course it is you know but based on what i've seen you know i feel comfortable saying that i think that that case leans heavy guilty but always subject to trial everything that i ever say is subject to trial you know i, I will never say somebody's innocent or guilty flat out ever it's just i can't do it you know and and with and i feel the same way about Coburg. and, and there is a huge pro burger <laughs> like you know that he's been he's been set up that he's a patsy that there's it's corrupt all that stuff and i'm just not seeing it there you know to me he's the guy that makes sense to me like they're like the guy and he's another guy that when he's arrested all kinds of people come out of the woodwork talking about what a creep he was <laughs> you know like the same thing that happened with rex you know so it's like again though do i know of course not it frankly jay there are many trials where it'll go through an entire trial and they'll find them innocent or guilty and i still don't know we can never know no there's no way to know no unless the defendant turns around at sentencing and says my god i'm so sorry that i did this then we know you know because there's only 
two people, if it's a, a one victim, one perpetrator crime, there's only two people that know what really went down, and that's the defendant or the perpetrator and the victim who, if it's a murderer, is no longer with us to to tell their side of it. So, you know, th those are the only people that know definitively. You and know. even look at the Apple River case. Even when we have video, we still don't know. We're still trying to figure it out because you could have – that's the whole thing. Like you could have different perspectives, different <laughs> witnesses who say different things, who have different angles. Like we have one angle in that in that video, right? We don't have all the angles. There are things that are people are alleging that happened that we didn't see. So like even if see. you have video, even if you have a video, you don't know. And you got to go by your best – got to go by – the jury has to go by the evidence that's presented to them. And the arguments made by the attorneys. And then, so, you know, and that's what it comes down 100%. to. hundred yeah. percent. And like, I love that trial. I love that trial because it's different. It's not a who done it, right? Like we know who did it. So the question, it's one of those, like, it's one of those questions is were his actions justified? You know, it's a, it's a very different type of trial. That's why I wanted you and I to, to jump on it and stream it for a while. Just say, because it's fascinating. It's completely different. It, it's much closer to to the kid what's his name zach whatever his name uh, was. latham latham yeah you, you know i mean like we love that because it was fascinating because it, it's like that's a real debate because that that really boils down to not did he do it or didn't he do it but what do we think individually and, and all of us are allowed to think something different in terms of what is reasonable what did he have a reasonable belief that he was about to to be victim of seriously serious bodily injury or death. You know, was that a reasonable expectation? Did he was that a reasonable fear of his? And did he act in accordance with that fear with the proper amount of force, or did he act with too much force? You know, and it and the same thing with and it's the exact same question that they have going on in Apple River. Which, by the way, closings are going on on that right now. It would sure be nice, Jay, if. We get a verdict back on that during a break during that this case. So we cool. can do a quick pivot, jump over there, do that, have a nice little chatty poo about that, and then jump back to this. So, we'll <laughs> By the way, speaking of breaks, if you're coming in like late, folks, right now we are just on break. They, The prosecution, they did jury instructions. The prosecution has given their opening statement, and then we're waiting for the defense, John Breyer, to give his, his statement. And like I said, I'm kind of – I'm very curious to see – what he's going to say in this statement is he going to bob says he's going to throw alex it's going to be it was alex cock is he going to bring up Lori? was this Lori? it's it's uh it's going to be very interesting to and bob talks about all the time you know the prosecution gets to put out their case you don't get the defense's case generally speaking until this moment that we're about to see like and a lot of it and by you talk about this bob too is like there's theories and trials like how much are people listening after the opening like how much how important is an opening statement like is that jury once they get in their head like i mean in this case i think the evidence is so overwhelming but that's just but in generally and like maybe a case like the apple river case that opening statement can be pretty freaking important if like you because that's when they, they that's when they start if if truly they don't have an idea what the case is that's when after they've gone through the voir dire they've got they they kind of have an idea but now they're getting the pr presented to them and how important is that like you got to that you're you're, you're it, developing their opinion up for the final verdict right there. This is the beginning. This is your chance. Hundred percent. You know, I've had those debates with lawyer friends of mine for years, including my wife. You know, like she was typically the opener, and I was typically the closer. I mean, like many lawyers believe that you can just absolutely win the case on openings, like because that's the first impression. You know, that is the first impression. And if you come with a powerful opening statement, you could get people locked in on like, oh, shit, you know, because you're telling them. <laughs> I apparently have an excited voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So but closings are equally can be equally powerful, you know, but but closings are different. Like sometimes you're in a position as the attorney where you're trying to. You know, rehabilitate damage that was done during the trial. Like, like yesterday when I was on court TV, we were covering the, the Mew thing and, you know, both, uh, Michael Ayala, who was the host and the other attorney I was with on there, they both felt that, um, Nick Mew had like really, really hurt himself with his testimony, mm. you know, so, so much so that, 
you know, he, they, they, they think that he, you know, they were saying, oh, well, he, they're, they're probably going to the state and asking for a plea, you know, wow. or an offer. Wow. That and, bad. Huh? Did you yeah, think that when you were watching? No, I didn't. I didn't feel that way. Um, I, I didn't think he helped himself. I don't, I don't think that he destroyed the case. And I know for a fact that he's got at least one really, really good defense attorney. His guy uh, that he has that represented Kyle Rittenhouse, which, um, you know, I, I was not thrilled with that verdict, but I mean, the guy's a hell of a lawyer, you know, and, and I, he's going, he's going right now. I'm assuming he's giving the closing um, and I'm sure he's crushing it, you know? So it's like, you know, both openings and closings are very powerful, but um yeah, so y'all keep us up to date. Like uh, Todd said, that uh, one of our one of our always viewers um, said that uh, defense is closing in that case now, and that dude's crushing it. So, uh, which does not surprise me. Like I posted um, one of his cross examinations. It was just textbook. It was the kid, the screamer, <laughs> you know, the kid who was filming all the shit. Uh, right. You know who was like. <laughs> You know, and he just trapped him. He trapped him into shit. Like one of the things that he did was like uh, trapped him into. Okay, well, you would claim that that because they were asking the the kids the question, the same question. Well, you don't own the river. This guy's looking for something. Two now, two pieces of property. You've got you know the phone and and the goggle set, and and you know you're telling this guy to leave. Well, why didn't you leave? And so the kid had said, oh, well, he was blocking our path. When you see that one portion of the video, and we we played the video on our stream yesterday, Allison threw it up, you know, it was the part after he drops the goggles in the water, kind of circle circles around their float and, you know, kind of looking in the water, trying to find the goggles. And then he's like 10 feet away from the, the, the float of tubes. And, you know, the, the guy says, okay, and at that point, this Maddie, the, you know, the screaming lunatic woman, the drunken screaming woman, um, you know, she she gets Derek or Nick Mew to come over there and walk over there. And so he does. And then what his attorney traps him into, he's like, well, he's like, he was no longer blocking your path. Correct. He's like, well, yeah. And I mean, technically, he's like, so you could have left. You could have floated on by right then. Couldn't you have? And the kid had to say, yeah, you know, because it's like it goes both ways. Those kids don't own the river. They don't get to dictate. They don't get to tell people to go away. They don't get to do shit. You know, it's like, that's like, they don't own that spot of the river. They're on a, a moving river. And this guy was looking for property. I like, I don't know. So what else also happened was that um, the state woke the fuck up and they decided to include lesser included. Cause that's what I was saying. There's, there's, no way in hell I'm ever convicting that guy of intentional first degree murder ever not under no circumstances. So now they've added uh, the lesser included, which is, which was a really smart move. Cause and you it, could do it, that, that late in the process, you can adjust sure. the, uh, oh okay. yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. So let's see. I think Mandy or Diz sent it. To, I think Mandy sent it to me. So, uh, the state on Tuesday said it is also seeking lesser charges related to the initial counts there. For count one, the death of Isaac Schumann, also consider second degree intentional homicide, first degree reckless homicide, and second degree reckless homicide. So the, the, the reckless homicides fall more in line with like voluntary manslaughter type, uh, tar, uh, type charges, which is where if I was going to convict him of anything, it would have been that you know, based on going into the trial, you know, cause it, it's like you look at the end result and you see that this poor kid lost his life. You can see how it devolved to that. You know, the, 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 like none of those kids are coming into this with clean hands. You know, frankly, they started the situation. If they would have just been acting like normal people, you know, like if the guy would have approached me and, and my people, uh, I would have said, look, I, uh, I am, you know, I'm, I'm willing to help you look for your shit. I wouldn't have started calling him a child raper. You know, I wouldn't have saying he's looking for little girls, but I'm a grown man. 
I'm not a teenager who's shit faced. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so they created the situation. You know, he had every right to go look for his friend's property. You know, I, I certainly would. You know, if, if Allison dropped her phone in the lake or in the river, I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'm going to go over. It's a, it's like, it's, you know, 12, 12 inches deep. I'm going to go look for it. See if you can find it, you know? So I, get it. I can hear the audio. Oh, there we go. We are back folks for the, Let's let me go. update the ticker here. We're going to have the defense opening statement. Uh, let me put back up the. Why is it now not the same? What did I do differently? Oh, I know what it's not the same. It's because it's not like this. There we go. By the way, thanks everyone for being here. If you could hit that like button, if you haven't already, again, if you're one of my subscribers, please subscribe to Defense Diaries. If you want a Defense Diaries, subscribe to me. We'd love to have you. We are over 1,200 people in our between YouTube and Twitter. So thank you all so much for being here. We love you all. Trial. I don't know if you guys can hear. That's Prudence, my dog. She says hi, too. What, Prudence? I think Prudence way, is saying uh, squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> yeah, I can't say. I have to say SQ in front of them because if I say that word, they're, they're out yeah. and they're barking. Uh, I do want to say I have a portal set up, folks. Tonight, um, and if folks don't know what a portal is, because I say it in this case, actually, there's a different kind of portal in, in the chat. Uh, we, we, this, it'll redirect when we're done. I mean, we'll break for lunch right. and we'll come back. But if you guys aren't subscribed to um, Catch Justice, it's our good friends Raul and Jessica for Justice tonight yes. at, 6, at 6 p.m. They have their third episode. We highly recommend it. So when my stream ends, it'll go there. Just give it a like. But if you're not subscribed to them, give them a sub. They have a great channel. We love Raul and Jessica. So we do. Uh, we do. They're awesome, awesome human beings. Yeah, if the mods could share their I don't have their link, but if you guys can uh share it, that'd be great. The girls will find it. Great. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. We've concluded our morning recess. We're back on the record on KCR 22-21-16-23, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Gabel. This is the time we will next have opening statements by the defense. Mr. Pryor, is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May I have the post permission to enter the well? You may. Thank you. And maybe check that microphone and make sure it is working. Okay. Very well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as an introduction, I'm John Pryor. I'm the defense attorney for Mr. Daybell. And I'm from Meridian, Idaho. I'm an attorney from Meridian, Idaho, over here on the west side of the state. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today. And um, at my age, video presentations are not something that would come easy to me. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, my view of the case and the facts and evidence. And what's important are facts and evidence. I think that when we went through the jury selection process, we talked about facts and we talked about evidence. And the judge gave you an instruction to talk to you a little bit about uh, you take into consideration the facts of this case, not be distracted by other things. Don't be distracted by speculation. Don't be distracted by guesses or assumptions or hunches. It all comes down to facts and evidence. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the facts and evidence in this case. Chad Daybell, uh, and I'm learning this, and I've had some time to learn about this because it didn't come natural to me, but Chad Daybell went on what is called a mission early on in his life. And I guess what a mission is, and I'm not familiar with that, but I guess what a mission is, is they go away to a location and they talk to people about their religious beliefs. And Chad's faith, that was important as part of his faith. And when they return from these missions, uh, they start the process of moving on with their lives. 
And when Chad got back from doing his mission in New Jersey, he met Tammy Daybell. Uh, another fact that I discovered, and you'll hear a little bit about, is that Chad had an extended um, uh, engagement, had an extended, by his faith standards, uh, uh, romance before they got married. Uh, Chad and Tammy dated for approximately six months. And what I understand is by their nature, six months is an extended uh, dating process uh, before you end up getting married. So after six months, they got married. They were married in Utah and uh, pr proceeded then to have uh, children. They have five children, now all five adult children. At some point, they moved back here to Idaho or moved to Idaho, and uh, they started a small publishing company. And you'll hear testimony that the publishing company was predominantly run by Tammy. Tammy managed it. Tammy was the brains behind the, uh, the, the company. And uh, Tammy basically took the reins and did everything that was necessary to move this publishing company. It was a small publishing company, a very small publishing company. And what they did is basically publish books. Chad would write these books. And he would write these books about his religious experiences. In his faith, he had certain beliefs, the faith that he practiced, you know, when he went on his mission, when he, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, read his interpretation of uh, the books that he used for his faith, he uh, started writing books about things that were consistent with his faith. Things like premonitions. We've all heard of premonitions, about being able to predict things, about being able to see maybe when things happen. And, and some people believe in that, some people don't. Some people have personally experienced that, or I've been here before. But he writes about his premonitions. He writes about um, good and evil, and what it means to be good, and what it means to be evil. He writes about dark and light. He writes about um, subjects that are a little darker, like death, and maybe the coming of uh, the end of, of things, and, and when his savior in his mind is going to come back, and, and maybe uh, there'll be some kind of a redemption of some sort. But his books covered a lot of subjects like that, and they were all based on fiction. In other words, he was writing these books about theories and things that came into his head, and he would, he would write these, uh, these stories. But he also wrote children's books, and he wrote books for teenagers. And he wrote these books about adventures and, and, and uh, you know, some crazy ideas about things that kids and teenagers get involved in. In about October of 2018, Chad was going out and he was invited by one of the uh, witnesses that you'll hear in this case to, to speak about his books. And this was not uncommon. He would travel and he would be asked to say, well, come and talk about some of the things that you, uh, you believe in. You, you've, you've talked about these premonitions, some life experiences. You're going to hear testimony about that. And he was invited on one particular occasion in late October. And he attended this, and while he was there trying to sell his books, and like most of us who are business people, um, the focus of these meetings really was for Chad to try to get his books published, because that's how he made a living. And he was there in one of his booths trying to promote his books, and he laid them out there, and this beautifully stunning woman named Lori Vallow comes up, and she starts giving him a lot of attention, and she pursued him. And she encouraged him. And you'll hear testimony that she went so far as to grab behind the booth and um, sort of help him in trying to sell some of his books. She obviously had an interest, and maybe she felt that he was this, this publisher, or maybe she had an opinion. You'll hear testimony about that. And then after the seminar, there was a, a length of time where there was no contact between the two of them, a month, month and a half, two months. Um, and during that time, Chad Daigle went on his day-to-day -day life. He'd been married to for Tammy for some 29 years, uh, has no remarkable background of any kind. I think he, the testimony we went off will show he had a, I think he had a speeding ticket in 2005. But Lori Valley was a different story. Oh, boy. Lori Valley oh, boy. was someone who, right out of high school, married her first husband. You'll hear testimony about 
Do you guys hear the beeping of the truck backing up? Oh, uh, Lori. Uh, the bus. <laughs> the, the bus is backing up, folks. Wow. Short-lived. Very short-lived. She then married husband number two a few years later. And again, very short-lived marriage. And there's some testimony indication that there were some same problems with the marriage that uh, caused the breakup. But the concern seems to be, the theme seems to be that uh, Lori's brother, Alex, and you're going to hear about Alex Cox. Alex Cox go, was Lori's protector. Mm -hmm. Alex Cox would do anything and everything to protect, aid, and assist Lori Vallon in whatever her endeavors. Without unbridled question, anything. <clears throat> and if Alex Cox even perceived that there was a problem, Alex Cox reacted. You're going to hear testimony that in 2007, I believe it was in August of 2007, Lori Vallow had finished up going through her third marriage with Joseph Bryan. It was a tumultuous, you know, her testimony that it was a tumultuous marriage. A terrible marriage. And Lori Vallow made accusations against Joseph Ryan of abusing their child, Tylee. Yes, the same Tylee. And during one of the visits of 2007, folks, and I want to tell you, you're going to hear testimony that in 2007, Chad Maybell didn't even know Lori Vallow existed. But Alex Cox, after one of the exchanges and the visitations with Tylee, Alex Cox approached. Joseph Ryan had shot him with a taser and assaulted him, was eventually charged with aggravated assault, was eventually put in jail, and had this on his record. And there is representation, the facts will suggest that at the time Joseph Ryan feared for his life. This was a serious situation. But it set the pattern for what we're dealing with with Alex Cox. Whenever there was a problem or a threat to Lori Vallow, you'll hear testimony that Alex Cox came to the rescue. But Alex Cox would run without even question and do whatever was necessary to solve Lori Vallow's problems. We're going to fast forward then to 2019. Lori Vallow is still married to Charles Vallow. And the prosecuting attorney mentioned this, yes, Chad Dable at that point, coming in January and February, started to have communications with Lori Vallow. And yes, folks, it turned into an inappropriate relationship. 2019 and forward. And yes, he was engaging in discussions. He was engaging in contact with her. All of the things that uh, the prosecutor talked about in terms of a, a relationship. But subsequent to the seriousness of this relationship getting rolling, Alex Cox was at a visitation in 2019 with Charles Vallow. And Lori Vallow was there. Tyree Ryan was there. JJ was there. They were all present. And during that altercation and that supposed visit, much like with Joseph Ryan, Alex Cox took out a gun and shot Charles Vallow. And then after calling 911, he then finished the job and walked up to him in close range, finished him off. Now, you're going to hear testimony that in some way, Chad Daybell was implicated in that, and, and you're going to hear further testimony that he was not. You're going to hear testimony and see documentation that suggests that the prosecuting attorney on review of this indicated that there is no likelihood of conviction of Chad Daybell. You'll hear testimony that Chad Daybell had nothing to do with the execution by Alex Cox, Charles Vallow. And the same for Brandon Boudreaux. You will hear that Chad Daybell is not being pursued for any involvement in the Brandon Boudreaux attempted murder. Those occurred and those are separate as well as the Charles Vallow. So what we have is we have a situation where someone who's 29 years old, Chad Dave, 29 years of marriage with Tammy Dave, no discernible issues in his life. And then Lori Vallow comes into the picture, Miss Texas, 
you'll hear testimony about this beautiful, vivacious woman, very sexual person, and very manipulative. And she knows how to get what she wants. And she drew, drew Chad Daybell into a relationship, and an unfortunate relationship, you know, that Chad fell, fell into. After that, things started rolling, and issues started happening, but eventually, yes, there was a murder, and there was a burial. And you've heard discussion about the backyard of Chad Daybell. Well, we have a four and a half acre farm in Fremont County, Idaho. And you'll hear testimony that the body of J.J. Vallo was discovered behind an irrigation pond and a tree out in the pasture. So technically, yes, maybe the backyard, but more accurately described as the pasture hidden behind a tree. You're going to hear testimony that also in the middle of this pasture was a raspberry patch, former raspberry patch that was then turned into a uh, place for them to bury the cats, the dogs, and all of the animals on the farm. Okay? Pet cemetery. Again, out in the pasture of the field and not the backyard. You hear testimony about that. You're going to hear from four experts that I'm going to bring forward. Ooh. And these four experts, the first one is going to be Dr. Greg Hampinkian. And Dr. Hampinkian is a, is a bit of a, a, a notable local from Boise State University. And Dr. Hampinkian is a DNA expert, considered one of the best DNA experts. He's been involved, has significant work that he's done on both the defense and for the prosecution. He was involved and led the team with Amanda Knox in Italy and got her exonerated because of the DNA evidence. He has substantial experience. And anybody or anyone who knows anything about DNA goes to Dr. Hampinkian first because he is the guy. And Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk a little bit about the DNA evidence that's found on the scene. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the fingerprint on the plastic that J.J. Vallow was discovered in was that of Alex Cox. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about the hair sample that was found on the plastic of Alex Cox and that it was Lori Vallow. Dr. Hampinkian is going to talk about several, and I mean several other hairs that were found on the plastic of J.J. Vallow. But he's also going to say that there was no DNA evidence no hair sample of Chad Daybell on Tylee Ryan or on J.J. Vallow. You're then going to hear from Dr. Raven. And Dr. Raven is a forensic pathologist, and she's going to talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding Tammy Daybell. And what Dr. Raven is going to say is that there's no indication that this is either a homicide or any other crime, and that the only conclusion she could come to is you can't determine what the cause of death was. Wow. There's no way to determine it. Tammy Daybell was buried. You'll hear testimony about that. And then a short time later, the police officer showed up and they dug her body up after she'd been buried after she was laid to rest, and then continued after the body was pulled out of the ground, and continued to uh, examine it for whatever they were looking for. And what you're going to find is based on that, Dr. Raven's going to say, you can't determine what the cause of death is. You're going to hear testimony from the Daybell children, from the children themselves, four of the five children, I think, three, three or four of the five children are going to hear testimony. They're going to talk about their mother's health struggles. They're going to talk about their mother's use of various medicinal uh, uh, treatments that she would use, oils that she would put on her leg, medicine and, and, and different herbs that she would take, and that her mother was suffering from that their mother was suffering from a number of maladies, and that she would refuse to go see a doctor or get it treated. And Dr. Raven's going to enlighten you a little bit about some of the circumstances regarding Tammy Daybell. You're then going to hear from Patrick Eller. He's a, a, 
He's a forensic digital data examiner. And Patrick Heller is someone who has spent his life in the military working um, uh, for various agencies, and we'll talk a little bit about that, within the government to do data retrieval and data research. And he's going to talk a little bit about the phone records that are involved in this case. He's going to specifically talk about the travels of Alex Cox, because you are going to hear testimony that Alex Cox went to Chad Daniel's property on the 9th of September. You're going to hear that Alex Cox approached Chad Daniel's property a half a dozen other, five or six other times. You're going to hear testimony that Alex Cox was there on the 23rd. And you're going to hear where Alex Cox was in a number of other times and places in his whereabouts and his travels for about a two, two and a half month period. And Patrick is going to, you know, offer you some information and data to support all of that. And finally, you're going to hear from a forensic anthropologist, and his name's Eric Bartolink. And Mr. Bartolink is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the nature and, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the nature of how uh, the, the remains of Ty Lee were uh, burned. Eric Bartolink is going to talk to you a little bit about the lack of complete skeletal remains and why, when Ty Lee was dumped out of the ground, there were there was not a complete set of skeletal remains. In fact, there were a number of pieces of that that were missing. You're going to hear a lot of evidence, and the judge has talked to us a little bit about not making a decision until you hear all of the evidence. And there's a specific jury instruction that talks about that. The jury instruction is, you know, consider all the evidence. Listen to the instructions from the court on how you're to proceed. Listen to the arguments of the prosecuting attorney and the defense. And then and only then do you make your decision. And at the conclusion of all that evidence, and at the conclusion of the judge's instructions, the arguments of both of the defense attorneys, I'm going to ask you folks to return a verdict on guilty. Thank you, folks. Thank you for your time. Wow, that was, that was short and sweet. Short and Thank sweet. All right, that concludes the opening statement of the defense. Then, this time we will commence with presenting evidence. Uh, I understand the state does have a first witness to call. Is the state ready and prepared to do that? <clears throat> You know, the state is prepared. We we spoke with your partner earlier. We thought we were going to have a brief sidebar. Oh, let's discuss our schedule and put a sidebar. Sure. Uh, folks, while they discuss this during this trial, I will do my best. If you see there is a bottom ticker. So if you ever come in late, I'll try to keep it updated with whoever the witness is. So if you come in late and you're not sure or whatever's going on. So right now they are talking about their schedule for the day. And if you didn't hear... The judge said earlier that they're going to go much like jury selections. They're going to go to three thirty their time uh, every day, which is five thirty my time, four thirty Bob's time. Uh, so just a heads up, three thirty uh, Mountain Standard Time. I guess they're on. I think. And thanks everyone for being here, guys. So we're just waiting yeah. to find out who the first witness is. Uh, I guess we shall see shortly. I, I anticipate it'll be one of the. Either the Melanie, Melanie Gibb, or Zaluma. Oh, really? You think it's gonna be like a like a? I mean, that's like how they actor. started it. They they you know they kind of they tell the tale, man. They they set up the story. They they you know really kind of delve into the formation of this union between um, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And I, I saw Brooklyn. Brooklyn clearly has not listened to Allison and I's coverage of. <laughs> Valo, which everybody should have. Uh, it's it's it was great. We we literally were still can. yeah. It, but I, I was very much of the mindset that Lori was the puppet master. I'm still of that mindset. I think that Chad is like a um, really really dumb piece of clay that she just like took, informed in any way. You know, she was searching. She was searching for a guy like Chad, and he had concepts. He had concepts that she knew that she would be able to to wrap him around her little finger and control him and you know she took his concepts like the the scale 
which was technically his because it was in one of his books. And she turned that into her own thing. Like if he came back, oh, I, I think uh, I, the scale number for me was a four. And uh, Lori would be like, yeah, sure about that there, buddy. I'm seeing more like an eight. He'd be like, oh, you're right, Lori. It is an eight. I think we should change it to an eight. You know, it's like she was running shit. She was the the Svengali. That is like no no one's convincing me. Otherwise, she, she was running it. So the question for me is going to become, was Alex the 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 henchman acting alone or was chad his partner in the commission of the crimes you know were they doing it together did they commit the crimes together did they dispose of the bodies together um you know it's gonna it's gonna be tough it's gonna be like it's gonna be an interesting trial you know it really is but at the end of the day i think it's gonna be the same result <laughs> no matter no matter what but you don't have that that same feeling of betrayal with respect to a mother to her children that just makes people physically ill to even think about that a mama bear would ever turn on their own kids. You don't have that. Council, thanks for uh, discussing the schedule. Here, we'll be to start with the state's first witness that uh, apparently will take some time. So we will plan on taking a lunch hour also at uh, right around noon, if possible. So, Mr. Wood, are you going to be calling the first witness? Yes, yeah, sure. And the state will be calling right here to see you. All right. Well, go ahead. Call your witness. We'll have him come up and sworn. Oh, I, did they say, is this Detective uh, Hermosillo? Is that what who that was? Sir, can you tell us by the way, I will say this compared to Lori's attorney. I mean, that guy was like falling asleep. That statement was much better. Cop. Yep, Detective Armacillo. I can't remember. I think he was third. I think he was third or fourth in Lori's trial, if I remember correctly. Dizzy, you know what you could do that would be really uh, fun? Sir, as you testify, uh, I just remember to make a audible response to anything that will be questioned. Uh, so the record stays clear and try to avoid speaking over the top of anyone questioning you. That in mind, then, if you would like to inquire in there. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Okay. Ray Hermosillo, H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. -L -L -L. Is that on? Your Honor, is that microphone on? Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. Like this. Detective, will you state your name and spell your last name for the record? Ray Hermosillo, H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. -L -L Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, what is your occupation? I'm currently a lieutenant in the detective division for the Rexburg Police Department. How long have you been a detective? Five years. And how long were you involved in law enforcement before you became a detective? Before I was a detective, 18 years. Have you worked for any other law enforcement agency, agency other than the Rexburg Police? No. And are you post certified? I am. Detective, are you, have you been involved in the case regarding Chad Daybell? Yes, I have. Do you know what Chad Daybell looks like? I do. Is he present in this courtroom? He is. He's at the defendant's table, for sure, in a low street time. Thank you. Detective, let's talk about how did you initially become involved into the, in the investigation regarding Mr. Dago. On November 1st, 2019, I was contacted by Fremont County Sheriff's Office. I was told that there was possibly a Jeep uh, that was involved in an attempted homicide in our jurisdiction. So at that time with that information, I contacted Gilbert Police and 
um, asked what they needed us to do to assist them. And what did you do? Gilbert Police asked us to seize the Jeep if it was located. Um, they gave us the address of 565 Pioneer, which is Rock Creek Townhomes. They asked, also asked us. I'm going to stop real quick. Uh, where is that address located? What city? Rexford. And what county is Rexford in? Madison County. So once you received that address, what did you do? <laughs> Gilbert asked us to seize the Jeep if we had located the Jeep. Um, they also asked us to perform intermittent surveillance. And so at that time, that's exactly what we did. And when you say intermittent surveillance, what, what did you do to perform that surveillance? When we were driving around, uh, when there was no other calls coming in, we were parking for other residents, behind the residents, take photographs of anybody leaving or coming in. Um, that's, that's basically what we did for the surveillance. And do you recall what dates you did that surveillance? Uh, the dates were between November 1st and November 4th when I located the Jeep at 565 Pioneer. Did you ever... Uh, see the defendant at that address? I did. There were a few times during the intermittent surveillance that we had taken photographs of the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and Lori Vallow, um, either coming or going from the residence. And, and that was between the dates of November 1st and November 4th? Judge, could we, have, for the record, have this officer established the I'm sorry, 2019. So, and did you that uh, when you talked about seeing Mr. Davo, was that between those dates of November 1st to November 4th, 2019? That's correct. And your primary job was to look for a Jeep. Is that accurate? Well, yes, that's correct. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handled. What's been marked? The state's exhibit 90. Very well, the court has a courtesy copy in council as well. <laughs> Mr. Wood, to clear it, it sounded like you said 90. This is 9 8. I believe it's three. Uh, double check. Here. So I just see the exhibit, so I can confirm my voice. Okay. Fine. You're correct, order nine A. And that would be exhibits nine A through nine D. Detective, do you recognize state's exhibits 9A through 9B? Yes, I do. What do they report to be? That is the Jeep that I had seized parked in the parking lot just outside of 565 Right. And was this were these pictures taken at the location of 565 Pioneer? No, these photographs were taken uh, at our in-town lot at the police department. Right. Did you take these pictures? I did not. But do you recognize these images as true and accurate representations of the Jeep you seized from 565 Pioneer Drive? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the state's exhibits 9A through D be under the evidence. Any objection from the defense? Judge, I'd like to move on to your immediate protection when we see the foundation. All right, you can board our or ask foundational questions, Mr. Breyer. It's kind of ironic that uh, John Pryor, his client looks like a potato, and his fucking microphone is a potato, too. You can't fucking hear anything from this guy. What? Potatoes? Thank you. <laughs> you mentioned that you were doing surveillance on the Jeep. Is that correct? That's right. <laughs> Did you have an occasion to get close to the Jeep during that surveillance? 
We had them located the Jeep during that surveillance. I located the Jeep on November 4, 2019, and that's when I had it impounded. Okay, and at the time of being impounded, did you have the occasion to go through the Jeep and observe the Jeep energy, or were you relying just on the photographs taken in the Jeep? Do you understand my question? No, sir. Can you repeat it? phrase that. Did you have a personal occasion to go through the inside of that Jeep and observe the contents within the Jeep? Your Honor, I think that that goes beyond the scope of this uh, specific exhibit. Uh, I guess the issue, Mr. Wood, is he indicated he did not take these photographs, and some of the exhibits also contain photographs of the interior of the Jeep, so I think it's proper. Uh, more dire and of an objection. Thank you. May I continue, Judge? Yes. Officer, all I'm trying to establish is I don't want you to be able to testify that uh, the, uh, you know, someone else took the pictures and this is what they found. Uh, I want you to be able, you're authenticating and, and you're under oath to swear that these are accurate photos. I'm trying to find out if that knowledge is based on your personal experience or is it simply based on the fact that you're relying on somebody else who told you this is what we found? So that's what I'd like you to clarify for me if you would, sir. Sure. I impounded the Jeep. I was standing next to the officer taking the photographs, and I also went through the Jeep personally. Okay, I would draw the objection to this picture. Thank you, officer. All right, exhibits uh, 9, E through D are admitted. Thank you, ma'am. May I bump to the jury? Mm -hmm. You may want to have a quick sidebar with counsel. Is it like a reporter? No. Quick sidebar, man, already? Expect a lot of those, Jaybird. That That's is going to be, yeah, you know. Hey, look, man, I thought Pryor's uh, opening was very concise for all the people talking about how he likes to talk i mean that was like 15 minutes so um it was shorter than the states i thought it was I mean, very i thought it was very concise i thought it was a thousand times better than laurie's uh, archibald where you, the man was like asleep essentially when oh like at my least God, those two clowns wow man they got on my nerves like you remember with that trial obviously wasn't streamed so they would release the audio at 6 p.m. every night. And then uh, Allie and I would like, really Allie, <laughs> would play it at one and a half times speed, taking notes, noting the portions that we were going to use for our pod. Um, you know, like doing the doing the heavy lifting for the listeners so they didn't have to listen to eight hours of testimony. We'd pull out all the highlights and then, you know, and it's like that was exhausting, man. You know, and it was like Hermosillo is a good, a good witness. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's a good cop. Like he, he comes off well. Um, it, like I really want to get to, I can't wait to get to, I, I hope they're calling Melanie Gibb and Zumella. <laughs> they're, they're, they're good. They're good witnesses. They're fascinating witnesses, you know, but they had a lot of dirt on, you know, like they were really focusing on Lori. You know what I mean? It's like they weren't they weren't homies with Chad. So I wouldn't be stunned. Like I think they'll still call him, but I don't think that the testimony will be nearly as long. You know, because like Lori really recruited them into the into the cult. I by folks, I saw that. You know, is it that the audio is not loud enough, or is it that you just it's hard to hear? Because I feel like I could try the volume booster, but I don't think it's an issue of I just don't think they have good mics. So even if I made it louder, it would just be a louder like indecisive. Yeah, for I agree. Just like louder echoey noise. Yeah, you know I mean? it'll just it'll be. I, I think it'll actually make it worse. Yeah, the I'm not in there. Probably suck. And uh, you know, plus we're getting the the um, you know, the sounds being piped through Zoom, which. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, we're going to have to struggle through y'all. We can do it. It's still better it. than getting audio at 6 PM. <laughs> God, dude. Like it's night and day. It's night and day. Oh, I know you guys aren't complaining about us. I just want to, 
I know some people who come outside might, and like again, just is just not. Wow, we're almost up to fifteen hundred combined people. Fourteen hundred fifty-seven. This is awesome. Thank you all so much for being here, guys. And the judge is back. All right, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to proceed with publishing with the court's instructions there on the sidebar, then you may publish uh, any or all of the photos. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I could have access to the other one. Detective, is this, this what you saw in State's Exhibit A? Yes. Is this the Jeep that you had been assigned to do surveillance for? That's right. Did you, did you ever learn who this Jeep belonged to? I did. Who did it belong to? It was registered to Charles Vallow, but we later determined that Tylee Ryan drove that Jeep. Detective, this is State's Exhibit 9B. Is this that same G? Yes. That's all I'm going to publish now. All right, thank you. Detective, while you are doing uh, your surveillance, you testified that you had occasion to see the defendant Lori Vallow. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see children with time? No, we didn't. Did you ever see anybody, anybody else with them? No. At that time. Were you at that time, were you aware of who JJ Vallow was? No. Were you aware of who Tyree Ryan was? No. So when you spoke with, is it fair to say that when you were initially contacted by another law enforcement agency, they did not ask you to look for those children at that time? That's correct. Detective, did your role in this investigation change after that? Uh, it did. When did that happen? After I had seized the Jeep November 4th, 2019, I contacted Gilbert Police and let them know I had the Jeep. Um, Gilbert Police Department flew to Rexburg with a few of their detectives and a few of their crime analysts to go through the Jeep and serve a warrant with the Jeep. They were looking for the infotainment center, which is the middle of the Jeep console. It has the GPS locations, things of that nature, and they wanted the information extracted. So when they were up here on November 18th, 2019, um, they asked me and the other detectives if during our intermittent surveillance, if we had seen any children and we told them we hadn't. They stated that they're, that JJ's grandmother. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. We're, 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 I tried to be somewhat uh, open minded about foundation, but I'm going to object. Oh, that's a question, Your Honor. Go ahead, thanks. So you did have further contact with law enforcement from Arizona? Correct. And which law enforcement agency was that? Gilbert Police Department. And it was a Gilbert Police Department that was looking for that chief? Yes, it was. All right. Uh, when you uh, when you followed up with them about the chief, did they give you any other information about their case? They did. Did any of that, in, that information regard children? Yes, it did. How old? What were you what were you told by your police? Judge objection here saying. It's coming in for the effect on the listener, Your Honor. 
Judge, could we approach? Uh, no, give me a moment to make a ruling on that. Oh, I like that, Judge. Don't let him approach uh, every time. I'll start. The witness can answer the question, but for only the purpose of effect on the listener, if you can clarify that with your witness, Mr. Wood. Sure. I really like that. Judge Boyce says no. You're not going to approach every freaking time. That's great. And any objections overruled. Detective, based on your conversation, what I miss? Kill the police. Nothing really. I just I like that. You know, I was prior kidding. like. Oh, I was did kidding. you hear? Oh, sorry. <laughs> did you take any action regarding any children involved in this case? Yes, we did. Okay. And for the purpose of. Of what you did, what what information were you given that you needed to look up on? We were informed through their investigation that JJ's JJ Vallow's grandmother was concerned for his safety. Judge, and I'm going to object at this point to renew my objection. That's going beyond. I'll yeah. also say that as a, as a bringing up your statements or whatever. Okay. Based on your conversation with Gilbert Police, what was the next step you took in your investigation? We, we were requested to do a welfare check on JJ Bello from the Gilbert Police Department. And Detective, had you ever met JJ Bello? No. I. Were you provided any identifying information as to his age or where he might be? We were provided very little information, just a brief description of what he looked like, his age, um, and where he should be, which was 565. Sorry, 565 Pioneer Road, where he lived with his mother, Lord Bell. <laughs> Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed states of the one. Judge, I'm going to stipulate to the admission of states of the one. All right. It's being offered, Mr. Wood. Yes, Your Honor. There are states of the one has been offered without objection. The or states to do it one. And your honor, with that stipulation, I'd actually ask that that the witness be handed states exhibit two and states exhibit three as well. Further stipulate to states exhibit two and stipulate to states exhibit three. Very well. Uh, then, presuming they're being offered, states exhibits two and three are, are also admitted. And just a little bit, they're going to be published again in the same issue we discussed before today. Yes, I'll do that. Thank you. Oh. Detective, can you look at states exhibit one? Okay. What is state's exhibit? That is a birth certificate out of the state of Louisiana. You know, where this is, we may, may I publish? Yeah. Detective, can you identify who this is a birth certificate? The name on my birth certificate is Kanan Todd Trahan. What is the birthday? May 25th, 2012. Nor is the place of birth. Lake Charles, Louisiana. Your Honor, if I may publish state significant date. Two, you may. The detective, I'm going to ask you to turn to the second page of State's Exhibit Two. Oh. 
Detective, what is State's Exhibit 2? It's a decree of adoption. And reading through that, do you, are you aware of who that is a decree of adoption for? Yes. Who is it for? King and Todd Trahan. And on the bottom of that, can you read the second to the bottom paragraph? That is a bit. The entire paragraph? Yes, please. It is further ordered the judge to decree that the name of the child, King and Todd Trahan, be changed as follows. Joshua Jackson Vallow and the Registrar of the Louisiana Department of Public Health and Statistics is hereby ordered to make the appropriate changes in its records. May I have all the stakes for the three year old? Yes. Dr. Florida States is a bit free. That is also a birth certificate from the state of Louisiana. And who is the birth certificate for? Joshua Jackson Bella. Second, in the course of your investigation, in the course of your investigation, have you learned what Joshua Jackson or JJ Bella looks like? Yes. Have you seen pictures of him? Yes, I have. Uh, were you able to access pictures of him from uh, iCloud accounts associated with his mother? Yes. Your Honor asks that the witness be handed States Exhibit 4. All right, the witness is found in the States of the Detective, you testified that you never <laughs> met J.J. Ballow, correct? Correct. Um, how did you come to know what he looked like? Through photographs you were given. All right. Um, where did you get those photographs? We received a few from Gilbert Police. His grandmother, Kay Woodcock. I think that's that's all I can remember. And I spoke with you briefly before. Did you ever have occasion to review iCloud accounts belonging to uh, Lori Ballow? Yes, we did. And on those iCloud accounts, did you find other pictures of, jo of JJ Ballow? Yes, we did. And did you find videos of JJ Ballow? Yes. Based on your investigation, what does Exhibit 4 report to be? A uh, photograph of J.J. Mellon. Uh, and you didn't take this picture, correct? Correct. But you recognize uh, that individual as Joshua J or J.J. Bella? Yes. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes, the state would uh, move to admit the state's Exhibit 4. The objection. Judge, there's a little bit of foundation that I would no, so what diary what's the source of that picture where did you uh, Lori's iCloud, Lori for style, iCloud.com. Judge, can we approach just briefly on this issue? <laughs> While well, they approach, we just went over fifteen hundred viewers. Thanks everyone for being here. Fifteen hundred thirty-eight. Where do you uh, see that number, bro? 
I don't see if, that number. If you on on mine, like if I look at the screen where like there's, it says live and it says, um, I don't know if you can see it like as a guest, but uh, it, it says live and then it has the time on it. Can you like when you're looking at the screen, like the video screen next to the chat, can you see that or no? Yeah, I see live and then the the time countdown, but I don't see any numbers. There's next to it. Oh, for me, next to it, it has the it has the numbers, and I can show like the breakdown. It's pretty cool. So you have 525 people on Twitter watching. I have 581 on Twitter watching. I have 218 on YouTube. You have 213, and I have zero on Facebook. Why do I? <laughs> I told you last night, Facebook. <laughs> and I got, and I have one one person. Whoever you are. On that kick. Is on Twitch right now. No, kick I, it doesn't it doesn't register for kick, but uh, one person on Twitch right now. Thank you, person, whoever you are. <laughs> wow. That one person on Twitch that's watching this. Oh, oh Diz, I don't want the witness list for Chad. I just want it for Lori so we can see the order in the field call. Is that correct, Mr. Pryor? Yes, Your Honor. All right, exhibit four then is admitted. Yeah, I mean, Serena says it's on Facebook. Yeah, and if you are on YouTube, if you could hit that like button, get us in the algo. That's JJ Bell. Detective, you were talking about receiving a request to do a welfare check, correct? That's correct. When did you receive that request? On November 25th, 2019. Late evening hours, I received a call from Detective Pillar with the Gilbert Police Department, and he requested that the judge come and object to this complaint. Her request is a hearsay. Uh, at this point, I don't hear an objection on hearsay, so you proceed. Go ahead and repeat the question, please. What did you do in response to that request? On November 25th, 2019, I received a call from Detective Pillar, the Gilbert Police Department. He requested that I do a welfare check on JJ Bell the next morning because he wasn't able to get a hold of JJ or. <laughs> that was the same as you're saying. Did you do a welfare check? For JJ Bell, we did. What date did you do that? November 26, 2019. How did you go about doing that? On that morning of November 26, 2019, myself and Detective Dave Holm went to Lori Bellows' residence where we presume JJ was at. Uh, she lived at 565 Pioneer, apartment 175. As we approached, expecting to speak with Lori, uh, we noticed the defendant, Chad Daybell, and Alex Cox um, unloading a pickup truck near the garage area. And at this point, were you aware of who Chad Daybell was? Yes. How would you learn about him? Through our investigation with Gilbert and communicating with Gilbert Police Department. And so you recognized who he was? Correct. And at that time, were you aware who Alex Cox was? Yes, we were. So after you saw them, what did you do next? I got out of my vehicle and made contact with Alex, um, he was standing at the driver's side of his pickup truck, and the defendant, Dave Bell, was on the passenger side. I asked Alex if Lori Bell was home, and he stated that she wasn't home. I asked Alex if JJ was home, that we were there to do a welfare check. Um, and at that point, Alex got a surprised, frightened look on his face, looked over at across the pickup at the defendant Daybell. Uh, the defendant Daybell then looked back at Alex and initially neither one of them answered my question. After they didn't answer your question, what did you do? I asked them again uh, if JJ was home and 
Alex Cox finally answered and stated that JJ was with his grandmother in Louisiana. When you were given that information, did it cause you any concern? It did because I, I informed Alex that it was highly unlikely because his grandmother. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. We're going to be getting into a secure I'll sustain that. Your Honor, I think we need the defendant's about to testify what he said to Alex Cox. Okay, that's not what I understood where it was going. You can ask the question, Mr. Lee. Detective, what did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely because K. Judge, I'm going to object. This is going to lead into hearsay. Your Honor, this is a statement by a declarant on the witness seat. It yes. cannot be hearsay. Overruled, and it is uh, permissible. So, objection overruled. What did you say to Alex Cox? I informed Alex that it was unlikely that JJ was with his grandmother Kay because she was the one who called him the welfare chair. And what was the response to that? There was no response initially. Uh, Alex again looked over at the defendant, Daybell. And they kind of both just looked at each other. Um, and at that point, I asked Alex where I could find Lori Bell. And did he give you a location to find her? He stated that she was in apartment 107, which is the same apartment complex, just a few apartments down. What did you do at that point? At that point, I asked Alex if there was a way I could contact Lori and asked Alex for her cell phone number. And Alex told me that he didn't have her cell phone number. So were you aware at that point that Alex Cox and Lori Vallow were siblings? Yes, through our, our investigation with Gilbert, we knew that Alex Cox and Lori Vallow were extremely close. So when Alex told me he didn't have a sister cell phone number, I assumed he was lying to me. What did you do once you received that information? Myself and Detective Holt left the defendant, Dave Allen Alex, at the pickup truck. We went over to apartment 107 to see if we can make contact with Lori. At that point, we were just trying to find JJ Vallow. And were you able to locate him at apartment 107? No, we knocked on apartment 107. There was no answer. So at that point, Detective Hope began knocking on neighbor's doors to see if we could get a hold of anybody who would know if they saw a little boy coming in and out of that apartment or who resided as that apartment. And while Detective Hope was doing that, I started walking back to my vehicle to call for more detectives to come over to our location. Why did you call for more detectives? Because of the deception from Alex. I wanted to figure out what exactly was going on. And we were going to start canvassing the area and knocking on doors. So the more detectives we had on scene, the better it was for us. And detective, to clarify, when you first saw Alex and Chad Daybell, did you speak with Chad Daybell? No, I personally did not. So I believe you testified that you started walking back to the original equipment. Correct. What happened then? As I was approaching my car that was parked in the alleyway, I noticed the defendant Daybell driving towards me in a black Chevy Equinox. It appeared he had just left apartment 175 and was headed towards me in the alleyway. So at that point, I stopped him to have a conversation. What did you ask him? I asked the defendant Daybell, when's the last time you saw JJ Vallow? And he stated it was in October in apartment 107 with Lori Bell. Did you ask him anything else? 
I did. I asked him how he knew Lori, and he stated he had only met her a couple of times um, and that he didn't know her very well. Did that response cause any concern for you? It did. Why? Through our investigation, prior to me making any contact with the defendant, Dave Bell, or Alex Cox, we knew that Alex, Gretchen, Chad, and Lori had been married two weeks prior to my conversation with them in the out. So, is it fair to say you were troubled by his demolition? What happened after that? I asked Mr. Daybell, excuse me, the defendant Daybell, if he had Lori Bellows' telephone number so I could get hold of her. Um, and he stated he didn't have her phone number. And did you have any further conversation? I did. When I was speaking with the defendant Daybell, Detective Hope saw me talking with him and started to walk back to my location. As he approached, I again asked the defendant Dave Rose for Lori's number because I assumed he was lying to me based on what I knew. And at that time, he did give me Lori's phone number. Did he tell you why he didn't give it to you in the first place? He did. He stated that he felt I was accusing him of something. And had you accused him of anything? No, I simply asked him the whereabouts of JJ and asked him for his wife's telephone number. Detective, uh, during this interaction, were you wearing a body cam? No, I wasn't. Why not? In the detective division, most of our interviews are in a controlled environment. We call people in the police department. We have an interview, interview room set up with cameras. So most of the time, we're doing conducting our business and our interviews at the police department. It's very rare we're the first officers or detectives on scene. There is one body cam between seven detectives. <clears throat> Unlike patrol, where a patrolman is assigned a body cam, a detective is not assigned a body cam. What happened after you got that information from the defendant? I called my lieutenant at the time and told him what was going on. I felt that based on the deception and lies from the defendant, Dave Bell, who is JJ's stepfather, the lies and the deception from JJ's uncle, who is Alex Cox. I felt there was more going on with the whereabouts of JJ. And so at that time, I wanted to get everybody over there to see if we could figure out what was going on. So I asked my lieutenant to gather some detectives and respond to my location. And then what happened? A few minutes later, uh, my lieutenant arrived with Detective Dave Stubbs, who had a body cam at that point. Um, we began knocking on doors. We went back to 175, which is Lori Dallas apartment, and started knocking on her door and didn't get any answer. And I apologize if I missed it. Who was your lieutenant? Ron Ball. All right, so after you weren't able to get any answers, what did you do next? Through our investigation, we learned that Lori Bellows' niece, Melanie Boudreaux, it was Melanie Klauski, no correction, Melanie Boudreaux at the time, it's now Melanie Klauski. She lived in apartment 174, which is right next door to Lori. So at that point, we knocked on her apartment as well to see if Lori or JJ was at that apartment. Did anybody answer? No, they didn't. What did you do next? I was instructed to go back to the police department or the prosecutor's office to see if we can obtain a search warrant to search the residence for J.J. Vallow while the other detectives stayed on scene and started knocking on doors in that complex. At that point, our only 
focus was to find JJ and to figure out what was going on. So we were going to exhaust every means that we could to see if we could do that. And that's why I went to the prosecutor's office to see if I could obtain a search warrant. Uh, and did you obtain a warrant that day? No. Why not? On the way to the prosecutor's office, Detective Hope, with the number that the defendant, Dave Bell, provided, called that number. There was no answer, but he left a message. Once we got to the prosecutor's office, Lori Bellow called back and she was instructed to open the door. There were detectives outside of her door that wanted to speak with her. Okay. And are you aware of any other any detectives were able to make contact with her that day? Yes, they did. Do you know who that was? Detective Stubbs and Detective Ball. And you had mentioned earlier that Detective Stubbs had a body cam on, correct? Correct. And do you know if their interaction with Lori Ballow was recorded? Yes, it was. Have you watched that video? Yes, I have. At that point in your investigation, what did you do? After after Detective Ball, Detectives Ball and Stubbs had spoken with Lori Ballow, what did you do? What did you do next? We were informed that JJ was with a family friend. Judge, I'm going to object to this yeah. point. How about some foundation? Uh, let's sustain that. See, prior to the objection, did you speak with Ball and Stubbs about their interaction with Lori that day? Yes. Did you speak with them that day? Yes. Did you watch the body cam of their interaction with Lori Ballow that day? Yes, I did. So you're aware of what she said to them? Correct. Based on what she said to them, what did you do next in your investigation? We attempted to locate the family friend to see if JJ was with her in Gilbert, Arizona. And who, do you know who that family friend was? Melanie Gibb. Were you able to contact Melanie Gibb? I was not. Did you have any interaction with Arizona Law Enforcement Bay about contacting Melanie Gibb? I did. It was starting to get into the later hours of that evening. So I contacted Detective Pillar with Gilbert Police Department, and I had him go to Melanie Gibbs' residence to see if JJ was there. Ultimately, we learned he was not there. About what time did you learn that JJ was not with Melanie Gibbs? Roughly nine o'clock at night. And what did you do when you found out that he was not there? I contacted uh, Lieutenant Wall and let him know. Um, and we agreed to meet at the prosecutor's office that next morning early to obtain search warrants for those apartments. Okay, and just for clarity of the record, which apartments are you talking about? Apartment 175, which belonged to Lori Bell, 174 which belonged to Melanie Boudreau, apartment 107, because that's the last time uh, JJ was seen based on the defendant Daybell's statements. Detective, were you able to obtain those warrants? <clears throat> yes, we were. What did you do? Well, what day did you obtain those warrants? November 27th, 2019, in the early morning hours. And on that day, did you execute those warrants? We did. Let's talk about that. Uh, where did you search first? We searched apartment 175 first. Was there a reason you searched there first? That was his address that we were given from the Gilbert Police Department, and that's where his mother lived. Uh, what did you find in apartment 175? So initially, when we broke down the door, everything looked ordinary. There were couches, there were papers on the table, 
there was food in the refrigerator, food in the pantry. Um, we went upstairs. There were there were beds, uh, pictures. Everything seemed that that people lived there. The thing that caught our attention was there were no clothes on the hanger in any of the closets. Zero clothes. Just a bunch of empty hangers hanging there like some people. Took the clothes off and, and left. Did you locate JJ in that apartment? No. Did you see any evidence whatsoever uh, to suggest that he had been living there? Yes, we did. There were a couple things. We located a child's Star Wars suitcase underneath a little crawl space under the stairs. It was mixed in with some what I can best describe as 72 hour kits. And the kits had like uh, flashlights, flares, water. The suitcase was mixed in with those. We also found an old prescription bottle prescribed to JJ of Respiradone. And then we're selling these photographs of JJ in, in the residence. And did you see any other evidence of any minor children? No. Correct. We did. When, when we first went inside, there were some scooters and a small child's, uh, look like a small child's bike right on the porch. Okay. Did you seize anything from the home that day? We did. Uh, I seized the respiratory and the suitcase. After you searched apartment 175, what did you do next? We searched 174, which was Melanie Boudreaux's apartment. Everything appeared normal in there. There were no signs of JJ or anything that, that he was even there. But we also searched apartment 107, and that was completely vacant. There was there was nothing apartment 107. Did you seize anything from apartments 174 or 107? We seized um, in the apartment 174. We seized some cash, large amounts of cash that were found in the closet. And the only reason we, we seized those were for safekeeping because we had kicked the door in there as well and it wasn't able to lock. So we took that. Did you locate any weapons in any of those apartments? So in apartment 175, when we were searching the garage area, we located several different style weapons, handguns, rifles, um, various calibers, Army knives, uh, a lot of different weapons that were inside the garage. And and why did you seize those? Again, for safekeeping. Um, that apartment didn't lock, and so we took those. So it wouldn't be stolen. And did you find any evidence? That JJ Val in, in, in his apartment 174? No. Did you find any evidence that JJ Val had been in apartment 107? No. Did you search any other building that day? We did. In apartment 175, we located a storage unit rental agreement contract. And on that storage unit contract was the name Lori Ryan. Uh, it had listed her as the tenant, and it listed the storage unit number as T52, and it gave an address of self-storage on Airport Road in Rexburg. So with that information, we were able to obtain a search warrant for that storage unit as well. And did you participate in the search of that storage unit? Yes, I did. Did you, what did you find there? There were a few bikes, children's bikes. There were boxes of winter clothing, some ice skates. Um, there wasn't a lot in the storage unit. There was a personalized, uh, like a family blanket, a big blanket, family photos. 
that were kind of sewn on to the blanket. Those photos had JJ Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and their sibling Colby Ryan were pictures of Lori Vallow. But other than that, there was there was nothing else really in the story. Okay. When you perform these searches, were you looking for Tidy Ryan? No. <clears throat> so to your knowledge, she hadn't been reported missing. That's correct. Your Honor, if I could have a brief step back. Yes. <laughs> All right, Betty's about to take lunch. Let's see, folks. Sidebar. What time did they say they were going to do it? It's 11.45 or 11.52 there? Uh, Yeah, so I think, I'm assuming 12 o'clock, but, I, you know, I'm not. I, that's a good question. I forgot. I thought he said something about 11.45, but I don't know. I could be wrong. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're setting up the, the trip. You know what I mean? It's like... Uh, this is when they they check that empty apartment because like they had two or three apartments in that particular uh apartment yeah right next to each other i understand this would be a good breaking point yes yep, for the lunch hours like that yes your honor okay we're going to go ahead and take our lunch recess at this time uh before we do that again i will just advise the jurors please don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else over the break in addition, for those in the courtroom, we will be closing the courtroom, I believe, during the lunch break. Uh, so things you have in here will need to go with you. We'll reopen uh, upon the conclusion of the lunch break, and we'll still be under the court's uh, governing order for courtroom conduct when we return. So thank you, everyone, for complying with that. Uh, with that in mind, we'll go and take our lunch recess now. All rise. Did he, does anyone here? Does he? That's the one thing that drives me crazy. He never says, "Like, is it an hour long break? Do we know? Is he? Are we going to be back in an hour?" I always try to like. I got to play. He likes to keep you guessing there, Jay. <laughs> he, he sure he does. Likes to keep you guessing. Once you check in the feed, oh, it's back. It's not back. It's back. It's it's back. It's not back. Son of a bitch! And now it's completely. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be an hour long break. Do you, does anyone have any idea? Yeah, it'll be an hour. Probably an hour. Maybe an hour ten. Uh, I saw a couple good questions. Um, Michelina Kimmel asked, how is it hearsay when Detective Hermosillo is the one having the conversation? Well, it's because he's trying to testify what somebody else said. That's why it's an out-of-court statement being the definition of, of hearsay is an out-of-court statement being offered uh, for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, and the the response by the state in that particular situation is that it's non hearsay because it was a declarant uh a declarant statement um meaning that it was a statement against interest basically which falls under non hearsay so there's hearsay exceptions um and then there's things that are considered non hearsay um and the judge found that that was uh non hearsay not under the exception there's exceptions such as um present sense impression um, is one where, or effect on the listener, uh, where, where you're not offering the statement, um, for, for its truth, meaning that the statement is true or not, but you're offering it for another reason. Um, so, uh, we could get into a very, very long, uh, hearsay, it, like hearsay was the most difficult thing to learn in law school. Um, it really was like in our evidence class, like hearsay took up a, a bulk of the, the class. Um, and let's see, I saw Elmi Albers saying that she was annoyed by uh, Pryor's objections. Well, get used to it. He's going to be making them. They have to. Um, lawyers have to make objections. That's how you preserve issues on appeal. And frankly, he won a majority of the things he objected. So. Uh, that should tell you that he's doing his job because that's what he's doing. It would be nice if we could go through entire trials without sidebars and objections, but it's not how it works. Have to have them because everything, if you don't make an objection at trial, the issue is waived for the purposes of appeal. 
No, I don't know that he'll object on everything. I mean, he, he had he had well placed objections. When when the defense lawyer is winning objections, uh, meaning the judge is saying sustained to his objection, that means he won the objection. Then you know that it, they're they're well timed, that they're they're proper objections. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb for y'all. You know, there's there's some some lawyers object to everything, which can get annoying. Um, especially if it's things like, you know, asked and answered, you know, things that aren't going to have any kind of effect on an appeal. Um, you know, but things like relevance, you know, you have to make those objections because if something's being introduced into evidence, it's not relevant to the issue at hand. It shouldn't be spoken about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw that Jacqueline. Um, we're probably going to do our own too, because <laughs> I'm sure theirs was uh, very much from the prosecutor side of things. It's good to have both sides. It's good to hear both sides of the story. Always. So, is your chat on the um, on restream like like five minutes behind Jay, or is it like current? No, I think it's current. Like, I let me see. It. So, I see Sean. mine is very much behind. Like the, are you looking at the one on the screen? Yeah, the one like right, over, like right, right here, where Shelly says Brooklyn, what's going on? And Shiraz says something to Doctor Von Von oh, me, oh no, like I have one on on like a side, like a sideboard. Well, that should be the same. Are you caught up on it? Like mine is like up to date. Like no, like, like my last, um, like so mine shows a bunch of stuff. It says paired. Like I'll see duplicates of a ton of stuff over on this so, one. I'm so paired is mine. I mean, I think, or actually, paired is yours, right? Like, do you see right now? Lori was JJ step aunt by Diamond Eyes. Is that the my the last one that I saw? Um, was from twelve. Like the most recent one that I got is twelve thirty four. I think you're behind Bob because mine is is up to date. Are you sure you're on the right thing? Because like I see, how could I be behind? We're on a live together. <laughs> Well, because mine, I see right here, Shelly just said, hi, Bob. MJ says has a delay. Like, if you look at the screen, like, look at the, the screen that's right next to us. Like, th those are all coming up right now, aren't they? Yeah, those I see, but I have a second set of texts. Maybe that's because I'm a guest. I don't know. Oh, God, Do you not see that? Like, I see the one, yeah, the one that I'm looking at, what we have when we don't have the cord up is current. The one that I have, the second chat is way behind it's a, it's like it's almost 20 minutes behind like it's at 12 36 it's weird that's so weird because mine's yeah mine's i just so i at 159 yeah i watched the chat on on my phone on youtube if you guys are wondering what i'm looking at i'm, I'm reading the chat is that the one that's behind or the restream is the one that's behind the restream is behind mm -hmm. for me but not the one that we have on the screen with us right now that's, that's bizarre. current the one so I, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna show I'm gonna take a picture of it and show you see if your screen looks like this because it's way way behind it was yesterday too so like if you look at that can you see that I have the side <laughs> chat to the side yeah yeah that I have that side chat too yeah is yours like at the same speed mine is it, it matches what's on the side matches what's on the it must be because it's relaying it to, to me. You know what I'm saying? I wonder if I take it off. This, like right now, if I I just took it off the screen, it still says. Uh, the yeah, because yeah. like we didn't have the chat up when the court when the court stream was up. So yeah, I'm I'm always behind on there. So if you guys are wondering what I'm doing, I'm I'm looking at the chat and answering the chat because I can't answer on screen anywhere. I don't have I don't have anywhere to to chat. So I have to chat in YouTube. Isn't that weird? Well, could can you in StreamYard? Can it, oh yeah, you can right in StreamYard. Yeah. All right. If I have to, then I'll. Um... No, but I, I like that our I like that our people are together in the same chat. That's worth it to me. You mean on the side, like having no, one? like just in general? Because remember, like when we were in StreamYard, it's like my chat was my chat, your chat was your chat, and never. Well, they still don't think unless it's on the screen, they still can't see each other. I don't think. Oh really? Right. You guys can't see the other chats, can you? Right. If you're on my. If you're on my YouTube, you can't see Bob's chat. I don't think they got oh, it. Oh, I thought we could. 
that was super exciting to me. <laughs> like, oh, they can see all of our chat. All right. Yeah, so mine's super yeah, mine's way behind over here on this side. I don't know why. It's yeah. gotta be the relay. It's gotta be the relay, you know, like kicking it from because because you're running it and then it's it's obviously feeding it over to me. Yes, yeah, but so it's, only it's but it's picking up my chat. You know what I'm saying? So because right. I see both chats. Right. I see your chat and I see right. I see my chat. But they can't unless it's on the screen, they can't see both chats, which that would be cool. Do. Why don't they just have what we're seeing available to our subs? Right. I don't think there's any if anyone knows of any streaming option that I'll I'll research it, but that it would be so much better if everyone could just chat together. So yeah, it'd be I'll, great. I'll research that. That'd be great. All uh, right, so should we take lunch? I'm gonna, yeah. you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna speed through the uh closings on the I don't know if you saw Jay, the um uh jury's the jury's in, they're deliberating on the yeah, yeah. case. So we'll keep an eye on that. I'm gonna watch those closings. I want to see how the defense did, see how the state did, see if either one convinces me of anything. I'm so in the middle of that. You know, it's like it it fluctuates from minute to minute. You know, like I like I'm definitely not at a first degree, but now that they've added the lesser included, um, I could definitely because I like I was always saying from the get that to me it was a voluntary manslaughter type case. You know, like I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. It's like, but then again, I think if I was that dude in that situation, man, I, I don't know what I'd do. You know, like you'd definitely be afraid. Like they're like no, no one can sit there and say that if you're surrounded by a bunch of like Lord of the Fly screaming lunatics calling you a pedophile and a pederast and a child raper that you're not going to be afraid for your safety. I mean, it's it's bizarre that people are saying, "Oh, well, he stabbed all these people. He didn't do shit." <laughs> I'm like, what? Um, oh, cut Bob's mic then if y'all want to eat lunch. Are we? Do you want to stay on? No, I don't want to say what well, you guys <laughs> I want to have lunch. Uh, we go eat. We yeah, guys. Eat. We'll be back in uh one hour, three o'clock eastern, one o'clock uh two o'clock, two o'clock central, two o'clock central, uh, yeah, one o'clock mountain time. So I'll end this, I'll uh send it to you, Bob. And thank you guys all so much for being here. And by the way, again, when I end mine, <laughs> it's going to catch justice tonight. Make sure to like that, get in the algorithm. Um, Raul and Jessica have a great show. Yes, they do. And they're wow. wonderful advocates, both of them. Like, Absolutely. put in so much work. Heart and soul, those two. Put it all in. So make sure you're, you're following those guys. Yeah, lunchtime, guys. One hour. We will be right back. We're over 1,600 people combined. This is great. So we will see you guys in one hour. Look out for the uh, stream. So Mwah. thanks, everyone.